Uh, we're going to have an invocation today by Mario Melendez, as expec, ex, ex, uh, yeah, uh, explicable. Yeah, I am having. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I am having one of those senior moments. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Hey, but well, welcome in the Church of the Holy Apostle. That's right. That's yeah. right. Buenas noches and good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to provide an invocation for this meeting. Let us bow our heads. Loving God, remind all of us here this evening to open our hearts and minds to the ways of love, reason, and compassion so that we may always respect the dignity and worth of each other. Loving God, help us to renew the ties of mutual regard which form our civic life. Send down upon those who are in positions of authority in our city, Virginia Beach, the spirit of wisdom, charity, and justice, that with steadfast purpose, they may faithfully serve in their offices to promote the well-being of everyone, in particular those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed, in mind, body, or state, so that peace may prevail with righteousness. So say we all, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Most appreciated. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Madam Clerk, do we have a roll call? Yes, Your Honor. All present, excluding Councilmember Rouse. Okay. All righty. Um, at this point, uh, you know, could we have a, um, a motion for the certification of the closed session? Second. Okay. Motion and a second. Votes open. By a vote of nine, uh, 10 to 0, you have certified the closed session to be in accordance with a motion to recess. Okay. And now uh, I vote uh, motion for approve the middle, uh, minutes of the informal and formal sessions of April 5th, 2022, and the special session of April 12th, 2022. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, vote is open. I'll be abstaining on the meeting when I was absent. Which was the special session, April 12th? Right. Okay, right. yes. Uh, by vote of 10 to 0, have you approved the minutes as submitted, um, noting Mr. Moss's abstention for April 12th? Okay, this is uh, once again a very, very appropriate and fun part of our meetings. And Ray, are you around? How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be seen. How are you all? Good evening, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor, City Council members, City Manager, and Chamber guests. I am Ray Pearson Ben from the Communications Office, and I am excited to join you once again with the latest on the Nostalgic BB campaign. We would like to extend a thank you to all of our wonderful residents and visitors who continue to send in copies of pictures and videos that detail their most heartwarming memories. We will continue to share those tender moments in our social media. As we take a step or two closer to the celebration of the city's 60th anniversary in January of 2023, here's your first look at the Nostalgic BB Volume 4, which takes us back in time to 1978 to 1982. Things were in the works in the city of Virginia Beach from 1978 to 1982. In May of 1979, the Cape Henry Lighthouse closed out the 70s by opening its doors to the public for the first time since its construction in celebration of Armed Forces Day. Saying goodbye to the 70s meant bell bottoms were out and big hair and even bigger shoulder pads were in and Virginia Beach shoppers couldn't wait to check out the latest fashion and hang out in the food court at the brand new Lynn Haven Mall, which started operating in 1980 and had its grand opening in 1981. It remains one of the largest malls on the East Coast. 
Big ideas continue to come to fruition. In 1980, major conferences, trade shows, and even unforgettable personal events got a new backdrop with the opening of The Pavilion an $18 million convention center on 19th Street. Its sleek design wowed residents and visitors with its elegant use of architectural glass. In the same year, False Cape State Park officially opened with 4,300 acres of ocean beaches, dunes, marsh flats, and grassy bayfront. Mother Nature had big plans in 1980 as well. In that year, the city of Virginia Beach and its neighbors declared a state of emergency after the circus blizzard dumped up to 20 inches of snow across the region. However, the city of Virginia Beach recovered well, thanks to its amazing leadership and workforce, which now included 23 departments, one of its newest additions being the Office of Volunteer Resources, or OVR, which engaged and celebrated one of the city's most valuable resources, its people. In the mid-70s, when my mother was uh, starting the program, that was a period of exponential growth for our city. With the benefits of that growth come some problems and needs for services. I remember a very determined woman who was bound and determined to get that office going. And my father was extremely devoted to her. My dad often said to her, when you want to give up is when you got to keep going. And you got to keep going. And I think my mother recognized also that there are some problems that only volunteers can fix. Um, a lot of people think that throwing money at a problem uh, will solve it. But it's the value that volunteers bring to the role. Because volunteers don't have to be there, they want to be there. In 1982, construction on the Lake Gaston water supply pipeline began. This big project was a big deal. Find out why in an upcoming Look Back. If you have pictures or videos you'd like to share that captured the early days of Virginia Beach or proud reflections of what makes this city your home, we would love to hear from you. Visit vbgov.com forward slash nostalgic VB for step-by-step -step directions on how to get those pictures and videos to us. We thank you in advance for sharing. Oh, thank you. Great video. Thank you, sir. I do want to point out that this month in April, it is National Volunteerism uh, Week, so that is one reason why we want to make sure that that message is out there, that they are very valuable resources here at the city of Virginia Beach. If you would like to take a look at Nostalgic VV Volume 1 through 4, you can just visit the city's YouTube channel by searching Access Virginia Beach. And we invite you to subscribe and visit often to stay on top of the very latest from the city activities. And don't forget to share it and keep your friends and neighbors informed. This Nostalgic BB campaign presents us with a beautiful opportunity to look back at history and recognize those responsible for moving this city forward. Today, we have a couple of very special people that we would like to recognize and acknowledge. I would like to invite the mayor for the reading of this first proclamation. And as he gets in place, Floyd Waterfield Jr., please join me here at the podium. Come on up, Floyd. Welcome. Hey, you want me, Dad? Hey, right at the <laughs> podium. Uh, what I like to do with these things is kind of share the wealth and people that know each other and everything. So we're going to ask Miss Henley to read your proclamation. Well, they, they did tell me that I didn't have an hour like I said, <laughs> planned on. So you have, right. the, you have so the mic I'm now. <laughs> ready, ready to go. Hey, if, Lord, if you have me home by midnight, I'd sure appreciate it. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, whereas Floyd Waterfield Jr., who served as a member of the Virginia Beach City Council from 1970 to 1978, has served the community through his hard work, unwavering support, and tireless efforts to elevate the profile of the city of Virginia Beach and to enhance the quality of life for citizens. And whereas Floyd Waterfield Jr., has given of his time and knowledge to help shape Virginia Beach during the city's beginnings with decisions that helped cultivate it into an outstanding location 
for many to call home and an enduring source of pride in its high standing among other large cities across the nation. And whereas Floyd Waterfield Jr. has inspired others with his unyielding dedication to the projects and efforts throughout Virginia Beach to help establish the city as a premier coastal community. And whereas the city of Virginia Beach has greatly benefited from the foresight and enthusiastic support provided by Floyd Waterfield Jr., he is counted among the city's residents and co community contr contributors who have made Virginia Beach a unique and well-known place to live, work, and play. And whereas the community has been blessed by the wisdom and passionate advocacy of Floyd Waterfield Jr. as he has fostered relationships with the citizens of Virginia Beach and within the Hampton Roads area, and whereas by exemplifying the model of citizenship and service in the city of Virginia Beach, Floyd Waterfield Jr. has mentored and empowered other citizens to contribute their skills and talents to the community. And whereas Nostalgic VB is a celebration of Virginia Beach pioneers and residents leading up to the 60th anniversary of our great city in January 2023. Now therefore, Bobby Dyer, Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, does hereby proclaim Floyd Waterfield Jr., recipient of the Virginia Beach Diamond Award in Virginia Beach, and calls upon the citizens and members within government agencies, public and <coughs> private institutions, business and businesses, and schools in Virginia Beach to be of service for the benefit and betterment of the community so that future generations can appreciate and further uplift our beloved city of Virginia Beach. In witness thereof, he has therefore set his hand and caused the official seal of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia to be affixed to this, this 19th day of April, 2022, signed by Big Dyer, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you all very much for this, yes. and I yeah, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we're just going to point that forward. Like this. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Getting it straight. Thank you. I appreciate this very much, and I thank you for it. I'll tell you what, say, turn around and say no. a few words to well, us. Well, I'm just going to say this. I appreciate this, and I hope you all do this 50 years from now. But take my name off the list, because I probably won't be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank all of y'all. Thank you. 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 I'm going to ask a dear personal friend of Dot Wood. Okay. It, uh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Sorry. It is a real honor to read this because this is one of my very best and dearest friends and also a role model of if I always thought if I could just be half as good as she is I would be a really great person she's done so many wonderful things in this community and not only her her family I always sort of considered myself part of the wood family so um, anyway th th there's certain days that I'll speak to at least three or four woods in a day so <laughs> anyway uh, it's a real pleasure to recognize Dorothy Dot Wood. <clears throat> Whereas Dot Wood, who's contributed to the Virginia Beach community as a highly active and passionate servant leader through her hard work, un unwavering support, and tireless efforts to elevate the profile of the city of Virginia Beach, 
and to enhance the quality of life for residents. And whereas Dot Wood is given of her time to help cultivate Virginia Beach as chairs of the Virginia Beach Planning Commission, the Virginia Beach Performing Arts Theater Task Force, and the Virginia Beach Development Authority, Vice Chair of the Virginia Beach Performing Arts Center Foundation, and past president of Virginia Beach Rotary Club. And whereas <clears throat> Dot Wood was named a first citizen of Virginia Beach in 2000, but her contribution reached beyond our city. Serving as a board member on the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area, the Commonwealth of Virginia Strategic Planning for Economic Development, the Commonwealth of Virginia Small Business Advisory, the Commonwealth of Virginia Department of Business Assistance, Women's Business Task Force, and the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance. And whereas our city has benefited from the efforts of Dot Wood, who was counted among those who helped pioneer the Virginia Beach Office of Volunteer Resources, Virginia Beach Meals on Wheels, the Sandler Center and other community endeavors that make the city a unique place to live, work, and play. And whereas the community has been blessed by the wisdom and passionate advocacy of Dot Wood as she has fostered relationships with the residents of Virginia Beach and within the Hampton Roads area. And whereas by exemplifying the model of citizenship and service in the city of Virginia Beach, Dot Wood has empowered other citizens to contribute their skills and talents to the community. And whereas Nostalgic VB is a celebration of Virginia Beach pioneers and residents leading up to the 60th anniversary of our great city in January 2023. Now, therefore I, Robert M. Dyer, Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, do hereby proclaim Dorothy Dot L. Wood, recipient of the Virginia Beach Diamond Award. And read the whole in the bottom, yeah. In Virginia Beach, and I call upon the citizens and members within government agencies, public and private institutions, business and schools in Virginia Beach, to be of service for the benefit and betterment of the community so that future generations can appreciate and further uplift our beloved city of Virginia Beach, and witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused the official seal of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia, to be affixed this 19th day of April, 2022. And, and if we can ask uh, Dot Wood's family to join us at the podium. Thank you all so much. I did bring you some beautiful and wonderful friends that have made our city good. Best. And like, though, I started volunteering at the Pendleton Project when my son was two years old. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful city, and having Mary Russo as your friend, you must volunteer. <laughs> she taught me about volunteering, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Come on, family up too. Come on. Come on, family. Come on, Thank you. I'll send them to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Love you, Carl. You got it. They do. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, whatever you say about Dot Wood is uh, will always be a Cliff Notes uh, version, but she has done so much. And when we have this recognition for people, the many people that are here, the people that have been around, it's obvious Virginia Beach has been a great, magnificent city for 60 years. And we are constantly in the state of evolving, but the foundation was built on so many people that have done so many great things, and that's why we are the city we are today. Okay, so at this point, we're going to move on, and we're going to have some other special recognitions, okay? 
And at this point, uh, I asked uh, you know my friend Michael Berlucci if he would be so kind to do the uh, Autism Awareness Month resolution. Thank you, Mayor. And we are honoring uh, two very special organizations today, the Families of Autistic Children in Tidewater and the Autism Society of Tidewater, Virginia. And I would just invite them to come up now. Welcome. Thank you guys for having us. Good Welcome to see you. And thank you for being here. Uh, whereas autism spectrum disorder affects an estimated 1 in 44 U.S. children and 1 in 45 <laughs> U.S. adults and is a complex condition that affects each person differently, resulting in unique strengths and challenges, and whereas autism can cause challenges with verbal and nonverbal communication, social interaction, and repetitive behaviors, and can affect anyone regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or socioeconomic background, and whereas autism is often accompanied by medical conditions that impact quality of life, and whereas a comprehensive collaborative approach will help promote connections to support uh, services, uh, community, and resources that individuals with autism need to live fully across their lifespan, and whereas early diagnosis and intervention tailored to individual needs can have lifelong benefits, easing the transition to adulthood and fostering greater independence, and whereas each person and family affected by autism should have access to reliable information and supports, and whereas individuals with autism should have opportunities to reach their full potential, and the whole of society stands to benefit from this, and whereas two of the nonprofit organizations located right here in Virginia Beach providing services to individuals diagnosed with autism as well as family members impacted by autism are the Families of Autistic Children of Tidewater, FACT, which serves hundreds of individuals with autism, autism each year through its social and recreational programs where individuals with autism develop and grow their social and communication skills and become more integrated in our, in our community. FACT hosts six weeks of day camps each summer, three different ongoing monthly social programs, a, mis a mix of sports, leisure, arts, educational, and life skills programs six days a week during the school year. FACT also partners with other nonprofits to, to provide five family fun days each year. The Autism Society of uh, Tidewater, Virginia has been a local affiliate, affiliate of the nation's oldest leading grassroots autism organization the Autism Society of America for over 40 years with a mission to create connections, empowering everyone in the autism community with the resources they need to live fully. The organization serves thousands of local families through parent education, respite nights, support groups for parents and adults with autism, 5Ks, family and sensory friendly events, partnerships and collaborative efforts with local businesses, churches, and law enforcement to increase opportunities to improve experiences for people on the, on the spectrum in their communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Virginia Beach City Council pause in its deliberations to recognize FACT and the Autism Society Tidewater, Virginia, for your efforts to address the diverse needs of individuals with autism and their families and recognize April 2022 as Autism Acceptance Month in order to create a kinder, more inclusive world for people with autism spectrum disorder. Thank you very much. Okay.
Hi, everyone. My name is Tyler Williamson. I'm the executive director of FACT, Families of Autistic Children of Tidewater. Uh, I just want to thank you all so much for everything you do and for the proclamation and for recognizing the month of April as Autism Acceptance Month. Um, not only do I do my work with FACT, but I'm also the older brother um, of an individual with autism. And so he was diagnosed when he was two years old. I was three at the time. Um, we're very close in age. So being able to see how much and how big of a difference raising awareness, sorry, raising awareness and acceptance about autism has really changed over these last 30 plus years is just so huge. I know it means so much to our organization. Um, we've been here for in Virginia Beach doing our summer camp for this is our 25th year in a row. And we're very excited to have call this city our home and to be based out of here and not only to be able to provide that summer program, but also to be able to provide year round programs now um, after school and on the weekends and serve so many different families. And, um, you know, our biggest one of our biggest focuses is community integration, getting these our kids out in the community um, and getting to meet people and meet their peers. And um, it's it means a lot to us to have Autism Acceptance Month be recognized by the city because it's so integral to our um, to our mission. And it means a lot to me just as a brother and as someone who is, you know, dedicating my life to working with these kids. So I can't thank you guys enough. And uh, I'll turn it over to Al from the Autism Society. Sorry. As a mother of an autistic child who is going to be 31 years old. This month, when we started our journey, there was nothing, absolutely nothing. And we made it our mission to change that for the other families. And we are going to make Virginia Beach very proud of what we've got in store for this city as far as services that are going to be provided. And we hope to make Virginia Beach a model in the services for these individuals. And thank you for this recognition. And if I could say, Virginia Beach is proud. Uh, I've been a health care provider for a number of years now. And since I've had the privilege of being mayor and a council person, uh, I've been to a number of events. And what I see is remarkable. I, uh, I see the families coming together and supporting each other, which I think is really critical, you know, in, in, tar in terms of the holistic approach to everything. But if, be assured of one thing, we're proud of you already because once again, you're the glue that holds us together and makes Virginia Beach such a great, wonderful city. Thank you and God bless you. Okay. So I have just a little oh, quick please. little spiel. Um, I think it's uh, quite appropriate with April being National Volunteer Month that um, it's also um, uh, Autism Acceptance Month and our programs are predominantly 90% uh, volunteer based. Um, all those services, they're just a few staff, but many volunteers from board members to all the people who make things happen on all of our events and our camps and all those things. So, um, you know, it's a wonderful thing. I think April is an awesome month, also the month I'm born in, so obviously. Um, but just getting back to uh, autism, um, I am a provider, a mental health provider, and I specialize in working with autism. And so I see people from all ages. And Autism Society has been a wonderful place for me to be able to provide my, vol my services voluntarily and to support the families. And Autism Society has been a wonderful place for so many people um, on the spectrum and their families. The Autism Society of Tidewater, Virginia has been working for and with the people of autism, with autism for the last 40 years to advocate for civil rights and services that allow people with autism to fully participate in the community. Our mission is to create connections, empowering everyone within the autism community to live fully with the same opportunities afforded to their neurotypical peers and to maximize their level of ability. <clears throat> autism is not a disease or something to cure. It's simply a neurodevelopmental di diagnosis with characteristics that impact individuals in various ways and to various degrees. Hence, the spectrum. More importantly, it's a condition that's so far-reaching and so common that any of us would be hard-pressed to find a family or community that doesn't have a person with autism living in it. ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, is also the most diverse presenting disorder that I have ever seen in my 20 years of clinical experience. As the saying goes in the autism community, <clears throat> if you met one person with autism, 
you've met one person with autism. People living with autism don't want or need pity. They want to be respected, accepted, and embraced for their differences. And many of those differences we find have more in common with their neurotypical peers than many of us realize. In our advocacy efforts, we not only work to advocate for the rights and treatment of those living with autism, we also seek to partner with those, with others in the community, to bring about a greater level of inclusivity and opportunities for positive interactions and successful experiences. Whether it's in collaboration with nonprofit organizations or partnering with four business profit, uh, businesses, large and small, or working with public officials at local and state levels. And because there are so many people living with autism across all ethnicities, religions, social economic backgrounds and communities, we have been fortunate to see some bipartisan efforts to pass laws and policies that move us closer to a more inclusive and supportive society. But there's still much work to be done. On behalf of the Autism Society of Tidewater, Virginia, our friends at FACT, and the individuals and families that we serve, I'd like to thank the City Council of Virginia Beach for this acknowledgement and resolution for Autism Acceptance Month. We look forward to working with you all on our current and future efforts to achieve a shared vision of community where people living with autism are connected, empowered, and embraced by their neurotypical neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, come on up, say a few words. We love putting people on the spot. I do just want to thank you all for recognizing um, us and um, thank you for the wonderful work that you guys do. Um, Al pretty much said it all. <laughs> so thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Everything they said. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we got a ditto. Okay, that's a good thing. All right, and at this point, uh, we're going to ask Council Lady uh, Wooten to acknowledge the Fair Housing Month proclamation. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Whereas the City of Virginia Beach is proud to join the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and celebrating the 54th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And whereas the Fair Housing Act enshrined into federal law, the fundamental right for all who live in the United States to obtain housing, to obtain housing of their choice free from discrimination. And whereas the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, and disability, and the sale, rental, and financing of housing, and whereas Virginia's Fair Housing Law expands protections for all who live in the Commonwealth and prohibit discrimination based on elderliness, sexual orientation, gender identity, military status, and source of funds. And whereas the proper enforcement of this law requires the ongoing cooperation of all levels of government, those in the housing industries and private citizens, and whereas throughout the city of Virginia Beach, the spirit of cooperation is made stronger with the support of countless agencies nonprofits, and community organizations committed to affirmatively fathering fair housing and whereas promoting equal housing opportunity is the bedrock of our national civil rights policy and essential to upholding our city's values of promoting justice in all areas of life, celebrating our diversity and fostering inclusive communities. Now, therefore, I, on behalf of Mayor Robert M. Dyer, Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, do hereby proclaim April 2022 Fair Housing Month.
Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, and Council Members for this proclamation acknowledging uh, your support to all residents of Virginia Beach that support the inclusiveness and the diversity um, and the harmoniousness of, that's important to all neighbors in the city of Virginia Beach. Myself, I'm the director <coughs> of the Department of Housing, as you know, and my partner, uh, Jessica Guglielmo from VBCDC, Virginia Beach Community Development Corporation are very proudly accept this um, on behalf of all the partners in the city of Virginia Beach that really do care about fair housing and promoting fair, ho fair housing for all people in the city. Thank you so much for the proclamation and for recognizing the importance of fair housing. You know, where we live, raise our families, um, that has a lot to do with our well-being and, and, and our health overall. And so I'm very proud to be part of a city whose leaders embrace fair housing for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there's a, you folks are a sterling example why, why <coughs> Virginia Beach is considered one of the most caring, if not the most caring, city in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that, uh, thank you all very much, all the participants. Thanks, Ray, for putting this together and, uh, you know, acknowledging some really special folks. Um, now we're going to move on to public hearings, and the first one is the lease of property, 25.6 plus or minus acres, located off Lansdowne Road adjacent to the Virginia Beach National Golf Course. We have one speaker, Barbara Messner. Good evening. Good evening. Your resolutions and awards are fascinating. Okay. Um, lease of city property. Um, let me put the other glasses on. And this meeting, you know, there were changes made the following day, which is pretty hard to keep up with. You know, it's different from the printed agenda. And this isn't properly signed, Mr. Dyer. You'll call for the special meeting. Okay, lease of 25.6 plus or minus acres located off Landstown Road, adjacent to Virginia Beach National, uh, National Golf Course. Um, you shouldn't be leasing city property. Uh, it takes it off the tax rolls, and you have a history of leasing property for only a dollar a year. And since I've been saying it many, many times, Mr. Moss has, you know, made an effort to, uh, you know, ask for a little bit more money from some people. But uh, we shouldn't be taking uh, land off the tax rolls, and you're subsidizing all private developers and select people. So I'm in opposition. Okay, is there anything else? No, no. Okay. We, she's the only speaker for this item. She's the first speaker for the second one as well. Okay, go ahead, and, uh, go ahead and go uh, ahead and start the second one. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, deck. Good evening, Ms. Henley and Mr. Uh, Jones. Okay, declaration and sale of excess property, excess property, 20,000 plus or minus square feet located 217 Sandbridge Road, 23,000 plus or minus square foot, square feet located at 2548 Sand Fiddler Road, and 27,000 plus or minus square feet <laughs> portion of Sandy Beach. You know, this is all public land and public roads. You've already given additional parking to subsidize the event houses. 
which have, you know, they, they've destroyed the quality of life for most people who just want a home at Sandbridge. So I'm in opposition because you've already added at least 300 maybe, you know, additional parking spaces because of all the tour bus and motor homes and everything. And you just have the one uh, fire department down there. So I'm in opposition. And you said, am I the only one for three also? No, there's other speakers for two. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank all right, you. thank you. The next speaker is Ashley McLeod. And after Ms. McLeod is James Horn. Thank you. Good evening. How are you all doing? I'm Ashley McLeod, and I'm speaking on behalf of Avon Gird Renewables and the Kitty Hawk Offshore Wind Project. Mr. Mayor, Ms. Vice Mayor, and honorable council members, I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight. Avon Gird Renewables and Kitty Hawk appreciate the city's commitment to support offshore wind that will generate clean American energy and look forward to working collaboratively with the city over the coming months to secure easements for the Kitty Hawk Wind Project. As a responsible developer, Kitty Hawk abandoned its interest in the parking lot to the north of Sandbridge Market to accommodate and deconflict issues with Global Links with respect again to that north parking lot parcel. Kitty Hawk continues to work with the city staff adapting our planning to utilize the parking lot parcel to the south of the marketplace. We look forward to continuing our engagement with Global Mink Links over the coming months and years ahead to ensure that both projects are afforded the opportunity to acquire the necessary approvals so that each can achieve their full unimpeded build out, including respective co-location in both the state waters and the city's rights of ways. <laughs> Kitty Hawk believes that, these, the, that the success of both projects will benefit the city, the Hampton Roads region, and the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. your time. The next speaker is James Horn. Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, James Horn. I live in Sandbridge, and uh, I'm here to show my support for the Global Link Subsea Data Cable Project. Uh, I've had the opportunity to review their plans, look at their construction methodologies, and I've worked with businesses in the Sandbridge area, along with representatives from Global Links, to try to uh, uh, understand what problems there were, try to deconflict any any issues. Uh, and Global Links has, uh, has been very uh, forthcoming and very amenable to the desires, the wishes uh, uh, down in, in the Sandbridge area. Uh, Global Links uh, worked to mitigate uh, concerns of the citizens of Sandbridge, uh, which garnered support for their effort. I feel the addition of high-speed, low-latency data connectivity will bring high-paying tech sector, sector jobs to the Virginia Beach area and to the region as a whole. Uh, addition of this connectivity will attract service providers to provide Virginia Beach consumers real choice in internet and other communications connectivities. And so I, f I fully support uh, the Global Links project. Thank you for taking your time to come here, sir. Thank you. Okay. That's all the speakers for that public hearing, sir. Okay, next is uh, public hearing is on the election for polling uh, precinct location change for June election from uh, Central Absentee Precinct to 577 Central <coughs> Drive. Uh, we have one speaker, Barbara Messner. Okay, which item, Ms. Barnes? Uh, public hearing number three. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Election polling precinct uh, location change for June elections. Uh, this is interesting. This is the Central Absentee Precinct uh, 577 Central Drive. And that's the one, I believe it was August, um, you know, 2019, that that was, uh, 
that was brought up and it was voted down because it wasn't near, you know, the bus locations for people who use public transit. And it was also um, an elected official who owned the property. And you wanted to move the entire voter registrar's office there. So we have major problems with their elections, major. And y'all are spending, you've already spent over 10 million of air tax dollars fighting the lawsuit, <coughs> which, you know, I think there should have been other input on, you know, from the citizens on, on what we want, not what y'all want, because the lawsuit was against the people who've been drawing the, the maps and the lines and like two people that both live on Richardson Road. Oh, I'm glad you think it's so funny, Mr. Moss. That little bump so you and Mr. Jones don't have to run against each other. So, yeah, um, I think we need to have special meetings, you know, where we can have input. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the speaker, sir. Okay, at this point, I will read the, uh, re uh, the speaker policy. I want to remind everyone that the, the city council speaker policy that allows certain representatives of groups to speak for 10 minutes applies only to planning items. All other speakers, whether speaking individually or on behalf of a group, will have three minutes to speak. Speakers are reminded that comments nor in the formal portion of the meeting must be limited to the subject of the item that is being considered by the council at the time you are called. When speakers are called on each item, the clerk will call those individuals who signed up to speak. We have several items with only one per, uh, speaker signed up. As such, the city clerk will call the speaker and identify each item they have registered on. The speaker will receive three minutes to comment on each item. Again, the speaker must limit his or her comments to the subject matter of the items they have signed up to address. Finally, I call upon all speakers and all persons in the chamber to be civil in their discussion and decorum. Whatever views you hold and wish to express, the City Council wants to hear from you and ensure that all viewpoints and all persons are respected. The best way to do this is for us to strive for civility and respect. We have one speaker on several items. Barbara Messner. First item Ms. Mesher will be speaking on is J3. Okay, are any items pulled because... J3 is your first item, ma'am. I'll let you know as, as we're going along. Thank you. Okay, I think it's important that when we have an advertised agenda, we should stick to the agenda. You shouldn't be able to pull what you want. And there's other people here speaking on that. Okay, so... Um, J3. Right, so apparently you've pulled one and two. Ordinance to amend the city code. Um, and there were two things. One was on Thursday you sent the notice and then you amended it and added something. That's not the right item, Ms. Messner. J3. J3. It says... It says Laverne Lane. Right. And that's the one that was changed. And uh, so there's something else here because I printed the original agenda. We e okay. So that, that's in Oceana Village. And those are, um, those are high crime neighborhoods in, um, let's see. Yeah, it, it's impossible when you pull these things and put them back. Uh, and I asked if you, if you wanted me to, Ms. Wilcox, if you wanted me to fill out a different card for this. Um, yeah, it's Oceana Village. Two of them are on Air Station Drive. And the other one's on Laverne Street. And, um, you know, it's, it's transferring land. And I'm in opposition because you don't take care of, uh, of this property. It used to be really nice, low-income, affordable housing. And uh, now it's blighted, and there's a lot of drug trafficking that's been going on for, like, the last 10 years. Okay? And uh, so the printed agenda you know, had central absentee ballot. That is not. Okay, that is and that's not, it. That is not correct. That is not correct. No. I, ha I printed it out. 
The we, first one. Mayor, there was a, an addition to the agenda. It was emailed out again. Ms. Messner received the email, as everybody else on, and it's been posted since Friday in the correct fashion. Okay, thank you. If you can continue. J4A. Okay. He's bringing you up. I also get the newspaper. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Frankie. All right. Uh, so that's the only one that was changed, though, J, correct? J4A is central absentee precinct. Okay. So three and four were changed because I only got the notice on three. Um, 10, 10 1, relocate the central absentee precinct for the June 2022 primary election to 577 Central Drive and add section 10-1.2 Ray office location of voter registrar in-person absentee voting to continue at the municipal center location but mailing and processing of ballots to occur at 577 Central Drive. Um, it's just non-stop changes with the polling station we should have permanent polling station. And, you know, going back to 2012, we've had long waits. It's just a mess. You change it every year, and there should be advance notice. And a neighbor that lives in another area got the, the changes by mail. I didn't get some of the changes by mail about the polling stations. So you're spending a lot of money for mailing, and everyone isn't getting it. Okay? So just for... Uh, a or A, B, and C? Just A. The next item is J6. J6. Okay. Res resolution designating May as Mental Health Awareness Month. Requested by Mr. Berlucci. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot of people including the victims of the mass shooting who have emotional problems and a lot of the family members and survivors and been kicking the can down the road on the memorial and they haven't gotten any help. You've taken money, you've partnered with the United Way. And I've done FOIAs, I've seen where some of the money goes. It goes to billboards, VB Strong, VB Wrong, VB... Sentara, uh, partnering with private uh, psychiatric things. If you took care of the citizens, all the citizens, and we really had um, affordable housing, and you weren't flipping houses and flipping shopping centers, we wouldn't have people that are so stressed. Okay, any more? J7. J7. Okay. Resolution uh, raised City of Virginia Beach Community Criminal Justice Board. Okay. You know, I noticed that um, you're having problems with fixing the, the new building that we're supposed to be meeting in that you've spent a fortune on. And also, I um, believe you bought the edge nightclub at the oceanfront and now you know that's not suitable so you've failed almost everybody here has failed to keep the citizens safe our roads safe and our taxes low all right j10 j10 resolution to authorize and direct City Manager, Mr. Duhaney, to execute an intergovernmental agreement between the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and purchase agricultural uh, reserve program easements, which is a major problem for some of our elected officials. I believe Mr. Knight, Mr. DeSteff, Ms. Henley all have uh, properties there, you know, that are subsidized. It's like you can't just subsidize one business farming. 
Um, look at all the people that lost businesses during COVID that couldn't operate. But it's been at least $20 billion since you started it. $20 billion subsidies to one type of business. And when you vote on these things, you know, everything on the budget, which is tomorrow, uh, one of the meetings, and whatever you vote on on this, you know, anything to do with excess property, leasing, selling, um, is three quarters majority, super majority. That's 8.2, which is basically nine members have to vote. And those who abstain, they should abstain. And whether you legally, Mr. Stiles, give them permission legally, which you work for them, um, it's morally wrong. Thank you. Is that it? No, ma'am. J11. Okay. All right. Ordinance to extend the date for satisfying the conditions. Um, okay. Ray, closing one half of an unimproved portion of Holly Road adjacent to 401 49th Street. You know, everything you've done since you partnered with Ruffin Thompson and Jordan on the uh, Cavalier Hotel, and then the subsequent two hotels, you know, everything's closed off. There's no parking. And, you know, closing these roads makes it harder for air, rare, you know, police EMS, you know, overworked um, police fire and rescue to get to things when you close off uh, these roads. Okay, that's 11. Next that item it? is no, ma'am, 12, J12. Okay, and I just noticed there's an, a new person uh, signed up to run for office, and I don't think anybody should be running for office if they don't read the agenda and come speak on important meetings like this and on the budget, you know. Okay, did you say 12? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, resolution to appoint Lauren Hopkins to the position of Deputy City Clerk, effective April 14th, 2022. And I did look at most of the agenda, but I couldn't make notes with all this. You know, there's a lot of other things going on. But basically, the City Council wants to appoint... Um, the clerks, but the, the clerk is um, supposed to hire her own staff and the city, if I'm not mistaken, no? Okay, well, the city manager. I, I mean, you know, you have too many departments, too many people, and there's been at least three people I know of who've left in the last year, the city clerk. One of them went to the economic development, which was this morning, and I'm sure, uh, I believe Mr. Jones and... Uh, Ms. Wilson were there for economic development and, you know, that was 8.30 this morning. It's just like all day long, y'all run this city with air money and air land and your profit. And I object. Okay? 13A. 13A. Additional streets for urban maintenance payments. VDOT, okay, requests VDOT accept um, payments and corrections to the road inventory for urban maintenance payments. VDOT, um, I mean, the work done and all these crazy roads and traffic, this place is a mess. It's never been like this. <coughs> I'm trying to think what year it was. You used to have all the roads paved every year at the ocean front, and there was no traffic, no construction at all. It wasn't construction trucks left in the street and on people's property and in the 
parking lots, you know, the dome, the historic dome site used for construction vehicles for s certain people. But yeah, we have a failure of a lot of departments that you're attached to and work with. Okay. Anything else? 13B. Uh, corrections to road inventory. I looked at that. There's a lot of roads. Okay, I'll, I'll go on. What else? Um, 14. 14. Yeah. Okay. Ordinance to award 5,000 community services micro grant to Virginia Beach Fire Foundation for Child Passenger Safety, CPS, training programs, public education, and child safety seat checkups. That's really nice. I don't know why it isn't in the inventory every year. And I think it, it would really be helpful to the police, fire, and rescue if you uh, had safer roads and... Um, you know, give some of these people the houses catch on fire. Give them uh, smoke alarms. Put something in there. You know, there's a lot of prevention that the fire department could do, but they're too busy, you know, doing all these calls for everything. Drug overdoses, car crashes, ho houses on fire. And some of these firemen have died because their equipment was outdated. So I don't approve of the way the city's run, and that's why I'm here. Okay? 16A. 16A. Okay. 8,868 donation from Virginia Beach Library Foundation. Operating budget repurchase equipment for Edgar T. Brown Local Hist History Archive. Edgar Brown was a wonderful historian. And he shared a lot of his images um, with me on 31st Street Park of the Neptune's Corner restaurant. Um, you know, there's, you're celebrating the history, but most of it's gone. The quality of life is gone, and um, it's just a commercial, dirty commercial beach and horrible, dangerous roads. So I... Um, yeah, at one time, his his properties, uh, his intellectual properties, which I I won't get into that at this time. Um, yeah, they shouldn't be available for people just to download, and uh, whenever they're used, they should have his copyrights on them. Okay. Sixteen B. B. Surplus, surplus funding from VDOT. Surplus funding. Ray, Capital Project Elbow Road Extended Phase 2B and transfer local funding to roadway project within the 2021-2022 Capital Improvement Program. And one thing I noticed when reading some of the full agenda, which I couldn't make notes on everything, um, was that you give the city manager, I remember when you made the changes back when, uh, when Spore was here, um, you keep raising the amount. So every month, the city manager can transfer between 25000 and 100000 of our tax dollars and you're not sticking to the budget, and we have debt. And who cares if it's triple A? It's debt. You should balance the budget without debt, and we shouldn't have problems in the city. Okay? 17A. 17A. 130,000 to Office of Emergency Management, 2021-2022 operating budget, personnel expenses. You know, 130000 transfer. You know, who's, 
who's taking care of the money? Who's auditing? Where's Lyndon Ramias? You know, what's the latest thing that he's going to find? You know, make sure he has enough staff and allow him and allow the police to do their jobs. Okay, B. 233,843 to Department of Emergency and Communications and Citizen Services, Ray, replacement of computers. Basically, a quarter of a million. Um, you know, apparently, you're not using the new building because all the parts haven't come in. I mean, you know, for IT. There's no excuse for you not to use the building and for you not to budget properly. And you shouldn't be building things that we can't afford and that we don't need. Okay. It, so it's open up on no, planning. Sir, that, that was been pulled. But there's other, yeah, there's other that's people. All. Oh, that's been pulled? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Consent agenda. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Mayor and Council, under the... Uh, Ordinances and resolutions, um, J3. Ordinance to declare the properties located at 108 Laverne Lane, 108 Air Station Drive, and 112 Air Station Drive to be in excess of the city's needs and authorize the city manager to sell the properties to the adjoining property owners. Uh, number 4A, 101 Ray, the relocate the central absentee precinct for the June 2022 primary election to 577 Central Drive and to add Section 10-1.2 Ray Office uh, location a voter registrar in-person absentee voting to continue at the Municipal Center location, but mailing and processing of ballots to occur at 577 Central Drive. <clears throat> Dropping down to number six, resolution uh, designating May as Mental Health Awareness Month. Requested by Councilmember Bellucci. Number seven, resolution of the City of Virginia Beach Community uh, Criminal Justice Board. And dropping down number 10, resolution to authorize and direct the city manager to execute an intergovernmental agreement between the Virginia Department of Agricultural and Consumer Services and the city regarding purchase of agriculture reserve program easements. Number 11, Ordinance to extend the date for <clears throat> satisfying the condition regarding closing one half of an unimproved portion of Holly Road adjacent to 401 49th Street. Number 12, resolutions to appoint Lauren Hopkins to the position of Deputy City Clerk 2, effective April 14, 2022. Uh, number 13, resolution to request the Virginia Department of Transportation VDOT to accept A. Additional streets for urban maintenance payments. B, corrections to the road inventory for the urban maintenance payments. Number 14, ordinance to award $5,000 community services micro grant to Virginia Beach Fire Foundation regarding child passenger safety training programs, public education, and child safety checkup events. Number 16, um, ordinance to accept an appropriate A, $8,868 donation from the Virginia Beach Library Foundation to FY 2021-22 Library Operating budget, budget regarding purchase equipment for the Edgar T. Brown Local History Archive. And B, surplus funding from the Department of Transportation, VDOT, regarding capital projects number 100529 Elbow Road Extended Part 2B and transfer local funding to roadway projects within the FY 2021-22 from capital improvement programs. And number 17, A, 130,000 to the Office of Emergency Management, FY 2021-22, operating budget regarding personnel expenses, and B, $233,843 to Department of Emergency Communications and Citizen Services regarding replacement commuters. And that's all, there's no planning. Okay, uh, any comment at this point? Okay, the vote is open. A second. We need a second. Do second. we have a second? Second. Second. Mr. Holt, thank you. I vote of 10 to 0. You have approved the consent agenda as read by Vice Mayor Wood. Okay, I mean, thank Mayor you all. Wilson. I'm sorry. <laughs> Too many ways to say Apologize. Rosemary. No, they it's pulled been pulled. Back. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, we're back to J1, and that is an ordinance to authorize the city manager to execute a lease for 25.6 plus or minus acres of city-owned property located off Lansdowne Road for up to five years with Dolly Family Farms, LLC. We have two speakers. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. Good evening. I just noticed uh, Mr. Rouse isn't here. If you get a chance, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear what you said for why he wasn't here. He's missed a few meetings. Okay, J1. Ordinance to authorize city manager to execute a lease 25.6 plus or minus acres of city-owned property located off Landstown Road for up to five years with Dolly Family Farms, LLC. Um, yeah, um, well, you shouldn't be doing leases with private property owners who usually do make deals with large companies. And, you know, every time I look at Ms. Henley, I remember the Green Line. Very few people know what the Green Line was, and that's why she was elected to protect the green line and the quality of life and uh, property. Okay, this is Lanstown and um, anyway, since I'm here and since y'all are gonna vote on this, I, I think it's important for me to say, even though I was told that when people get up and leave and then you vote, they're allowed to be considered absent and I think everybody should stay in here for the meeting. And if people need potty breaks or water breaks or whatever, that you can have a pause and a break. Because I don't think it should just be everybody up and down. It's extremely disrespectful and rude. Okay? And there's other speakers. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Gerloff. Good evening. I'm also speaking on the lease of the city property, the 25 acres, um, to Dolly Family Farms. Uh, reading the background, it states that Dolly has been leasing 45 acres, total premises. The city of VB owns 25 plus acres, and the city of Virginia Beach Development Authority owns the other 19 acres. So let's be very clear here who actually owns this property. We, the middle class taxpayers, are the rightful owners of this property. So, um, and we own all of the land there, located off Landstown Road, G-Pen 1494-34-4919 and G-Pen 1494-17-0763. I, being a taxpayer in the city of Virginia Beach, am an owner of this property. In the background, it also stated that the um, farming is beneficial for alleviating maintenance responsibilities and for, quote, keeping the total premises from devolving into wetlands in an area where wetlands are not desired, end quote. We all know there are major restrictions and fines for destroying wetlands, yet it seems that re representatives of the city are encouraging the destruction of wetlands. Why is this? I know personal property owners who owns their homes have very strict regulations on wetlands, but this here doesn't seem like that's, that's the case. As a taxpayer and owner of this property, I object to this land being leased for farming due to the nature of this land being wetlands. Those of you on this board do not have the authority to decide where wetlands are or are not to be. Mother Nature decides that. The destruction of natural environment is a major reason the city has drainage and flooding problems. You are all partly to blame for this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all the speakers. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, any other discussion? The vote is open. I have voted 10 to 0. You have approved that one. 
Okay, moving on to J2, ordinance to declare easements under the Sandy Be under the Sandy Beach and continue to the northern parking lot of Sandbridge Market in excess of the city needs and authorize the sale of easements to Global Links Data Center LLC rate offshore data cal uh, cable landing site. We have two speakers. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. I'll have a lot of irons in the fire, and you're burning a hole in their wallets. Okay. Declare easements under Sandy Beach and continue to the northern parking lot of Sandbridge Market in excess of the city's, in excess of the city's needs. It's our needs. It's not your needs. Uh, and authorize the sale of the easements to Global Links Data Center, Ray Offshore Data uh, Cable Landing Site. Um, you know, I read through this, Ms. Wilson, I was surprised that, um, you know, Brian Kerwin, who's done your uh, campaigns for several years, you know, is named uh, as part of this project. So I'm sure you don't want to be in the room to discuss this or vote on this. So, yeah, I'm in, I'm in opposition. Thank you. And we subsidize, Economic Development Authority met this morning, we subsidize Global Links, Steel Chainsaw, Taste Unlimited, on and on and on. People need to look at Economic Development Authority. We pay their salaries, and we pay for their high rent at uh, Town Center. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Gerloff. Welcome back. Okay, so this is also on the declaration and sale of excess city property located at 217 Sandbridge Road, 2548 Sandbridge Road, and portion of Sandy Beach, GPIN 2434-11-5201, GPIN 2434-11-5201. 7352 and GPIN 2434-11-8063. Once again, the taxpayers of Virginia Beach are the rightful owners of said property. As a taxpayer and owner of this property, I object to the sale of this property for several reasons. Number one, the grantee listed is Global Links Data Center LLC. Global Links provides access to I'm, I'm guessing this is Maria, M-A-R-E-A, subsea cable, a project by Facebook and Microsoft. Anyone paying attention these days can clearly see that Facebook and Microsoft are not friends of our Constitution since they are not friends of free speech, but instead choose to censor free speech. Um, neither corporation has a stellar reputation. So, um, to me, Global Links is guilty by associ association. They're dealing with the devil. Number two, under considerations, it's stated that this addition of subsea cables could encourage additional businesses to locate near Global Links data center and corporate landing. In other words, more big corporations. Just what we need. Wrong. Um, we don't want to encourage big corporations to locate here to our city. It seems that, there, that those of you on this board have forgotten that America's economy is great because of small local businesses, not big corporations, that become monopolies and destroy a government of the people. Since big corporations fund politicians, big corporations seek to destroy our liberty. Number three, the representative listed representative Listed on the applicant is one Brian Curran, who I believe Bobby and Rosemary, isn't that the same Brian Kerwin that has been connected to your campaign in the past? If so, then this is clearly a conflict of interest for both of you. So for the record and for the above reasons, I do not consent to my interest in this property, property being sold at this time. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay. Uh, this, yeah. I think that we ought to... It'd be legal to 
Okay. Uh, a pine on yeah, us being accused Mark, of. Mark, uh, us being accused of having a conflict with. Uh, <clears throat> I would not typically provide legal advice in an open meeting, but based on my understanding of the facts, um, the mere fact that someone represented a council member uh, as part of a campaign would not constitute a conflict under the Virginia Conflict of Interest Act. Hate to put you on a spot like Thank that, you. but I think it required a, uh, you know, clarification. Okay, uh, okay. Do we have a motion right now? I would just like to comment. I think one of the earlier speakers kind of mentioned a, another project in relation to this, and I want to make this plain. This only involves the Global Links data center, data subsea cables. It does not involve uh, any other project along with it. That would have to be another issue at another time. And I, I did visit the existing cable system uh, that was installed, uh, Croton and Pendleton, and made its way to um, uh, the corporate landing. And I, I, I think that this is going to be uh, very similar in the fact that it's not going to be an adverse uh, project. And, and I know that some of the folks at, at Sandbridge had some questions earlier, but I appreciate the fact that they have uh, had someone working with the folks and answering the questions, and I have heard uh, no feedback in opposition. And so I'm going to make a motion to approve. Second. We have a second. I have a discussion. I have a question from the city manager, I mean, city attorney, if I could, yes. just to know what the, because I looked for the agreement, couldn't find it. What's the operational definition of under the sandy beach? If the sandy beach erodes, does their easement get vacated? Is it as of the date of us doing it? Do we have the first six inches? What does, what's the definition of under the sandy beach? Well, operationally, I believe this is many, many feet under the beach where the lines would go, but it doesn't give them a right to the surface. Yes, but if you're, what I'm trying to figure out is, because it wasn't clear when I was looking at it, does it mean that where their thing starts down, or does it mean that the city maintains tangent to the air atmosphere? Under the surface, if you're talking about water, usually means anything below what the, where the water comes tangent with the atmosphere, but what does this mean? I think it's important not to have ambiguity, and right now I don't know what that means. Yeah, come on forward. The exhibit, which is attached as Exhibit A, shows the, the plan depth. Um, it's 75 feet to 30 feet. But is that the easement definition? Correct, and it is important to know once the, the facilities are built and installed, we're going to go back with, with precise depth, width, um, and location. So, so that will be, it'll be locked in space. Precise level above and below that Correct. will be the easement that they're purchasing. Okay, I just want to make sure that, that was clear and everyone understood what that meant. Thank you very much. Hey, anybody else? <laughs> hey, vote is open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have approved the ordinance. Okay, and now we're doing 4B. Okay, and that is 21-351, uh, 21-352, 21-353, and 21.354 uh, re residential parking permits. We have one speaker, Barbara Messner. Mm -hmm. Okay. I really appreciate having the correct agenda and Okay, so um I uh, I mean it's unbelievable 100 uh I don't care what the city attorney who's been here since 99 from Wilcox Savage has to say. Y'all know and Mr. Moss when Mr. Sessoms was in trouble before you, you were grandstanding, you had a resolution, even the appearance of a conflict. Where's that, Mr. Moss? Okay, which item? Okay. 4B. 4B, okay. Residential parking permits, you know. 
you know, these are, um, you systematically removed parking at the oceanfront. It used to be for the, for the people, you know, all the historians, you don't talk about, you know, this is all marketing and advertising videos. But we had free parking on the ocean side. Free parking. We didn't have crime. We, we might have had a little crime uh, and a lot of shady deals, but we didn't have the problems we have now. <laughs> so there shouldn't be residential parking permits because you're selling public parking. And the Institute for Justice has, you know, cited Virginia Beach on many things. Um, and you, you can't outsource... You already have uh, parking systems management. You have resort parking. They lease at Runnymede Pavilion uh, Building. You can't outsource in all these little vehicles, Republic parking and all these. Um, and that first one was a no bid that somebody told me they weren't going to vote for. Uh, I think $2.8 million. And they can't. They can't ticket in tow, but they can ride all around and you can use all these expensive cameras to see who, you know, who just left their car and then you, you know, can zoom over and give them a ticket. So, you know, we have major problems with parking and you, you give the parking lots to uh, quote unquote entertainment people. Okay, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Was that the only speaker? Yes, sir. Okay, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Yes, Guy. Um, I had just some comments. I'm going to vote in favor of this. Uh, it's basically a cleanup um, resolution from our parking uh, folks. But I just wanted to start. Um, use this opportunity to start a discussion that I'm sure will be ongoing about parking in our neighborhoods in the resort area. It is a problem that we have had, and I call it a problem because uh, while it's regulated, it, it continues to be a burden on our residents that they have borne for many, many years and with, I think, many promises that it would get fixed. I think our current man uh, city manager and, uh, uh, and his staff are well aware of this. I think they intend to fix it. I think they have every uh, good, and I think in good faith, that. So I don't mean this to be a criticism of them, but more an impetus to make sure that we get the facts necessary to move employees out of our residential areas, to find parking for them. Indeed, I think there is parking for them now that is probably not being utilized in public garages. So in the interest of getting some data gathering going, I, I, I would like to ask the city manager uh, if he could produce a little, some information for me related to this. Um, if you'll notice in section 21 dash uh, 351A, there are is a definition of an eligible business, and it it's based on certain streets and certain sides of certain streets. And I would like to, Mr. City Manager, if you could get for me the number of parking passes that you have issued to employees, business employees, say in the last fiscal year. And I'd like that, if you could, to break it down on a business by business, each business, what the business is, where they're located, how many employees they had, and whether they are located on the east side of Atlantic, the west side of Atlantic, the east side of Pacific, or Winston-Salem Avenue, which seem, or if I've gotten them all, seem to be the four. Uh, four streets there. Um, and I'd like to at least start, get, make sure we've got the data. 
And I think that's a good place to start. But my, I, I want to make it clear, my goal is to get employee parking out of the neighborhoods. I think the, the uh, I'm not blaming the businesses. I'm, I have nothing against them. But I think this problem has been around long enough. It's time for us to take the initiative to see that it happens. If that means we have to accelerate some parking uh, construction, if that means we have to uh, force uh, people out of the, at some point, that don't, aren't interested in coming out of the neighborhoods, if we have to force them out there, maybe we'll have to. I don't want to do that. I want to come up with a, a solution that suits, uh, works for everybody. But I'd li at least like to start with getting that information. I think the folks who live in the area surrounding the resort um, who are very supportive, extremely supportive of the resort and all of the merchants <coughs> there. I think they deserve our attention, and uh, that's just my way of starting it out. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Question. Yeah, John. I'd like to go to, if I could, with Mr. Tahan to line 21. I always like to focus on when something says but or accept. Would it be just as correct to read the syntax after but to read if a business has been authorized to reduce required parking, such businesses qualify for neighborhood parking? Would that be correct? Because right now it reads, but only if the business has not been authorized. It's like a double negative. Those are always got to be careful of those to reduce required parking of such a business. So I'm trying to make sure that if I turn that into a, a simple declarative sentence that it means the same. Sorry, Mr. Moss, one second. We're just reviewing no, the line no real problem. quick. That's why we have these meetings, to make sure we all know what we're voting on. So what that means, sir, is if the business is, does not have a reduction in parking, no hotel is supposed to have any type of employee parking within the RPP, first of all. That was one of, one of the points we wanted to make. But this is... Well, I, I just want to, is reading that, if I took out the but and the only and all the, the double negative parts and said, if the business has been authorized to reduce the required parking of such business, they qualify for neighborhood parking, is that correct? No. I, I would like them to answer. I'm just trying to make sure that they know what what they're enforcing. Yeah, I just want to make sure. That's what you meant, right? But only if business has not been authorized to reduce the required Right. So this, the, based on this language that's here, Mr. Moss, this is stating to me that they can't, it essentially is saying they can't use residential parking permits to reduce their requirement for parking. Well. But, it, but, this, but has not been authorized. So if someone's authorized to reduce parking, like we've done <coughs> conditions, we haven't met the, the parking requirement, then they could qualify for That's what I'm trying to get to is, but right, then, then they cannot authorize qualify. someone not to have to provide all the parking, would that business qualify for, for parking no. in the neighborhood? No. If their if intent was not, right? Correct. No. If, they are, if they're provided a reduction in parking, they are not permitted to participate in the program. I just want to make that clear. I just want to... It was a, I'm always cautious of double negatives. Um, then on line 47, the city manager or his designee, I would assume that that would not be further delegated to someone else. It, like if you delegated it to the planning director, he couldn't delegate it down to someone else. Mm -hmm. So we have the problem we had with the golf course. I'm just trying to make sure that that's what that means. And then on line 48, dominant land use, that's uh, not a quantitative term. Does that mean 60% of the parcels? Does that mean 80%? What is the operational definition of dominant land use on the street? I believe it's 75%, sir. So would anyone object if we inserted in parentheses 75% of the parcels on the street? Would that be amenable? I just want to make sure that people know what that means. I know Mr. Branch made the motion. But if that's what it means, I think it should 
parenthetically has 75% behind it so we know what dominant means. If it was uh, uh, all right. All right. With that, I, thank you for, very much for your cooperation and time. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, you know, vote, vote's open. As amended. As amended. Thank you, Mr. Brandt. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have adopted the ordinance as amended. Okay, moving on. Okay, that would be item 4C at 6.30, Ray Fishing on Beach during resort season at Little Island Park. We have two speakers. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. Um, this, this was brought up before. Um, anyway, you know, I mentioned fishing. That's a really healthy thing, and people use fishing for, for food. But it's very difficult and very expensive for people to, uh, to fish at the Virginia Beach Fishing Center. I don't know if that's been sold yet, but... Uh, you know, you have to get to the uh, places to fish. You, everybody can't afford, um, you know, short-term rental, hotel stay, et cetera, and, and parking. So I, I forgot to hold up the picture of uh, your parking scams. You know, dome parking lot, free parking, lot closed, VB parking, $10. <coughs> Thank you. The next speaker is George Gabriel. Hey, good evening. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Honorable Members of the Council, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, I'm actually here representing the Virginia Beach Anglers Club. I'm one of its officers. Um, and by virtue of the fact that I'm the corresponding secretary, that by default made me the speaker. Um, I also would like to uh, point out that um, I'm sparing us all an additional 60 minutes because I encourage the other 20 people who wanted to come and speak before you to just let my voice be heard in their stance. Um, we're in opposed to this ordinance, um, I guess I have to claim it, um, to amend the city code for section 630, Ray Fishing on the Beach during resort season at Little Island Park. Um, Virginia Beach Anglers Club has been in existence since about 1956. Uh, it serves to promote fishing to the residents uh, of our city, as well as to help tourists when they want to come down and get information about where to fish and how to fish the area. Um, and, and so fishing's important to us. Um, we all know that once we pass ordinances or policies, they seldom get rescinded. Sometimes they're, uh, they're passed for good reasons, but they never seem to go away if the problem goes away. Um, the concern with this one is that it's a continued erosion of access to our residents and even to some tourists to the resources that the city has, in particular for surf fishing. Um, when the club was originated, it started, it was founded by surf anglers. Um, who had a passion for surf fishing, and they held numerous tournaments, surf tor uh, angler tournaments, throughout the city for years and years. Unfortunately, as we all know, 9-11 uh, had an unfortunate negative impact on us. Um, it closed public access to a lot of the waterfront because the military owns a lot of it, or the government does, and that's understandable. But I think that's a prime example of how even when threat levels get better, policies don't change, right? It was easy to eliminate access. I doubt any of us ever think we're going to get that access back again. Um, I would hate to see us have policies that continue to drive either our residents or even tourists to other destinations other than here. Um, so if we keep limiting access to the beach, the natural inclination is to go further south where there is access. So having our residents have to go to North Carolina to do their surf fishing rather than stay home where they live and their tax dollars go to support all of this, I mean, that's just an unfortunate consequence of an action like this one. Um, lastly, I'd like to point out 
you know, and, and I think one of the speakers said it earlier, um, COVID tied everybody to their houses. A lot of people and government leaders were promoting outdoor activities. And fishing, oddly enough, was one of those recreational activities that everybody promoted. Um, and if you talk to your tackle thank, shops. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Oh, okay. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, dokie. <coughs> Do we have a motion on this one? Um, well, you know, we had a public hearing and there weren't any comments uh, a couple of weeks ago. I wish you had spoken at that time so then we could have had an opportunity to look at this. I'm going to, since we are hearing it for the first time that there are concerns, I would like to just defer this uh, for um, 30 days so that you can look at this. I, if and talk with the folks who have recommended this on the basis of safety and to make sure everybody understands that it's only the property that immediately adjoins the park and it's between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on weekdays and 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. on weekends. In other words, that time when the park is full of swimmers <laughs> And I think it's for the safety issue, and I hope everybody can discuss all of this and then come back and decide whether you still think it's a problem or not. And I'd like to hear from the folks who have recommended it based on the safety issue. So I'm going to move that we defer it for 30 days. Do I, we have a second. second. Okay. Any discussion? The vote's open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have deferred this item until May 17th, 2022. Okay, on to J5 ordinances to uh, approve um, Part A speakers at city council meetings requested by Dyer, Wilson, <coughs> Bellucci, Branch, Henley, Holcomb, Jones, Moss, Browse, and Tech. Uh, the first, we have two speakers. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. One time you you mentioned two or three speakers at a time, which is is really helpful. Um, <coughs> okay. Which item? Five. Five A. Yes, ma'am. Five A. Okay. Um, it looks like everybody, including Rouse, who's not here, and uh, Mr. Bellucci, who got up and left, you know, have a problem with, you know, speakers, air free speech taking up your time. You take up air time with your back and forth speaking, and it's air right. You print an agenda. You put too many things on there, and then you go back and forth, back and forth. I think one of the items was an hour and 30 minutes. I timed it. So that's what takes up time, three minutes per person. And most of the time, I'm one of the few people who shows up. So you're directing this at me because I, I pay attention. So it's, it's air-free speech, and you should not be tampering with their free speech. I think um, Mr. Jones or Mr. Wood, whatever y'all said, you know, brought it up before, and there were a lot more people, you know, speaking out at that time, and you backed off. So you shouldn't change the speaker policy. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Gerloff. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, this is also on the speaker policy. Um, so the law of the land is the supreme law, since it has been handed down to us by the Creator. It is constant, just as our Creator is constant. It is the same today as it was when we, arri we first arrived here. It has become clear to me that members of this board do not understand the law of the land meaning you do not stand under its authority, thereby placing yourselves above the law, the true law. The First Amendment states that the freedom of speech shall not be abridged. By limiting speakers to agenda items at council meetings, you have abridged the people's freedom to speak 
thus violating the First Amendment and your oath to uphold our Constitution. As long as speakers are speaking about concerns with our city, remember this city belongs to us, the taxpayers, not you, then that speaker has the right to speak freely. Now you are proposing additional restrictions on our free speech. This is unlawful since it does restrict the freedom of speech, which is clearly not allowed by our creator. Thank you. That's all the speaker, sir. Okay, do we have a motion? So moved. Second. second. Moved in a second. Any discussion? Vote is open. By a vote of nine to one, you've adopted the ordinance. Okay, moving on to uh, 5B, uh, council member sponsored forums and events requested by council member Bellucci. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. <clears throat> the second speaker is Seiko Varner. Your arrogance is showing. Um, your abuse of power is showing. Okay, um, B, council member sponsored forums. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and events requested by Mr. Bellucci deferred from April 5th. Um, because there was opposition and y'all went back and forth and you just kick the can down the road, add it to a, another agenda. Um, council member sponsored events. You have too many sponsored events. These meetings are supposed to be where we meet with you. Ms. Henley's the only one that has town halls. Everything else is superficial and you shouldn't be doing it. You should be doing basic city business. And, you know, if we don't live in her district, um, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't want us there. Um, but you all vote together. When Ms. Henley wants ARP money, then she helps you with the third hotel for the Cavalier. It's just a game. It's just a very, very sick game. Um, and there, there are people here who are running, but they're, they're not speaking on, you know, speaker policies or any of these other things. They're waiting to speak on something else because they supported the bond referendum and the people who wanted the bond referendum. And, you know, what I consider the, the shadow government and the people that just show up at budget and elect it in election time. Uh, it's really sad what you did with uh, the fishing all over the city, all the healthy things that, uh, that our kids need. You know, all the things that you do, all the events. You had an event at the Cavalier. You know, that's a public-private partnership. Easter egg roll at the Cavalier with, uh, so. Anyway, um, I'm in opposition. Thank you. Next speaker is Seiko Varner. After Mr. Varner is Conrad Schlesvinter. Good evening. Good evening, all. Good to see everybody. All right, so uh, greetings, and may the Almighty support us as we strive to bless the community. Let us bless the community rather than reduce opportunities. So every now and then, a policy designed to prevent problems causes problems. And this is the heart of the matter tonight. So I think that the solution being proposed will lead to a reduction of services to the community. So it's, it's not the proposal itself. It's not the thing that we're trying to prevent from happening. It's the solution. A different solution would serve this need better. The matter at the hand is the proposal that restricts council members in the production of events and events and activities that benefit the community. So I personally understand what is trying to be prevented. I also see that the strategy will reduce services to the community. And I don't think it's been 
being proposed for mercenary reasons. But I think the strategy will be mercenary. So I'm a member of the Community Action Team, and we empower the Hampton Roads Black community by providing tools, strategies, examples, and understanding to allow it to better do for self. To that end, we've begun releasing a quarterly report card evaluating the impact of our beloved elected officials in eight areas. Two of them are community over city balance and leadership. So let me chat about those two very quickly. We expect that our elected officials will champion initiatives that will focus on the citizens' benefit before the city benefit. That's our concern with community over city balance. And we expect that the elected, as leaders of our beautiful community, will champion initiatives that address longstanding or new community concerns. That's the leadership that we're demanding, that we're looking for, that we're going to support. So if Virginia Beach is going to be one of the most caring cities, I think we need to take care not to reduce services that benefit our citizens. And once again, my concern is not with what we're trying to prevent, but I do think the strategy is going to be mercenary. And I do appreciate getting uh, contacted and speaking with elected officials about this matter. And I thank you for everything that you do. Peace and prosperity continue benefiting and serving our community. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Conrad Shizventer. After Mr. Shizventer is Perez Gatling. Good evening, Conrad. Good evening. Now, I'm also a member of the community action team. Just a reminder that it is out there, and I'm one of the Virginia Beach watchdogs. And I watched what happened at the last meeting when this proposal came up. See, there is value to city council or leadership, and provo um, proposing events like Ignite and Disparity Forum shows leadership in the community. Letting the city know about it through engaging communication is a plus, especially as it tilts the scales from a focus on city budgets and minutia over to community improvement, as Mr. Seiko just mentioned. As the council approved the programs, it showed good political teamwork to bipartisanly agree to all have those forums, at least until it started to brainstorm ways that it might stop it. I've observed the vocal sections of school boards and council meetings and collections of folks outside whom share their anxiety over things like <coughs> equity or disparity or even our nation's racial history, especially their own anxiety about being perceived as suspect on that matter. They're not in power, though. Those that are in power in ways to be seen as good for all communities, but still might want to stop those programs, might want to shed light on boosting marginal communities, but they just might try to fix a process that isn't broken. This series and others aren't things that are broken. They don't need hoops to progressively jump through, exposing a good form to a popular vote each and every time subjects that already were approved and already allocated for because then it might lead to a failure to operate at all each time. That seems like the opposite of teamwork to me, the opposite of leadership, the antithesis of good communication and community city balance. Watchdogs against the strategy would support the city council not to support this program. Thank you. The next speaker is Perez Gatling. After Mr. Gatling is Clarence Neely. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, members of council, and uh, Mr. City Manager. Um, I'm opposed to the resolution. Oh, my name is Perez Gatling, and I pastor Ebenezer Baptist Church in Virginia Beach. Uh, I'm opposed to the resolution because it seems as if it is a roadblock to real progress. Uh, there's a fine line between self-promotion and promoting events and uh, education that benefit the community, especially under-resourced and under-utilized communities of people when it comes to doing business with the city. Uh, my church and uh, my community support Councilwoman Wooten, Councilwoman Wooten's efforts to provide local business owners and prospective business owners with the tools, resources, and information they need in order to grow and expand through the Ignite bu business series. Um, having to come back to council for approval 
for, an, for initiatives that have already been approved uh, subjects the process to daily and weekly vicissitudes and whims of members of council. And we all know that we are all subject to feel one way on one day and another day, another way, another day. Um, please don't allow this to be another program, process, and promotion that could benefit disparaged communities that is blocked or stalled at city council. I've spoken to a few pastors in the city over the past few weeks, and it seems as if this has become a pattern. Unfortunately, the African American Roundtable's CRP pro proposal stalled right here at council. The implementation of an election or voting system to replace the current hybrid system has stalled, and millions of dollars have been spent to contest the judge's ruling. As of right now, the partnership with the Department of Justice uh, is all talk and no substance. And we know that's not you, but it's all talk and no substance, all planning and no product productivity. Um, and what is coming out of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force? We hear council saying the right things. We do. And organizing the right task forces and committees. But we also see where the buck stops and sometimes where the progress stops. $3,000 is, is not a lot of money to continue a program that will change the lives of SWAM businesses in Virginia Beach. Finally, in the words of the late Ann Richards, the 45th governor of Texas, life isn't fair, but government must be. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Clarence Neely. After Mr. Neely is Melissa Lucasen. Thank you, anything. Vice, Madam Vice Mayor and City Council, thank you for having me here today. I'm, uh, I just want to be, uh, say that I've been in business in Virginia Beach for over 25 years, ever since I retired. And I never knew anything about SWAM until Sabrina Wooten, uh, Council Member Wooten, became City Council Member. I never knew what SWAM was. I became a SWAM certified company after her Ignite seminars, and voila. <laughs> magic begin to happen. So, and now I, I can just, just speak for myself, but I can also speak to some of my business colleagues in the area. Uh, SWAM has actually helped us out a lot, okay? <coughs> and I would like to see Miss Wooten and whoever else is involved in it to continue this Ignite series because it's helped so many minority and disadvantaged businesses around, and it's continuing to help people. I mean, the word has spread. The word has spread. So I'm going to ask you, you know, we are in a position right now to, uh, everybody's looking at Virginia Beach right now. I'm with you, Mayor, to get something in the water back. You know, I'd like to sit down with you to, to get that back. We want to get that kind of stuff back. We want to shine a light on Virginia Beach. It's not as bad as everybody thinks it is. It's a very good city. You guys are doing an outstanding job, in my opinion, including you, the city manager. You're doing an outstanding job. But I think we can continue this if we allow Ms. Brina Wooten to continue the Ignite series and continue to bless small and minority-owned businesses in the area. Thank you. The next speaker is Melissa Lucasen. After Ms. Lucasen is Carl Wright. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, Council. Good evening. I came to speak in opposition of the pending policy change, proposing a vote uh, requirement for what I consider to be customary and reasonable business expenditures that include or encourage council members to reach out to the community. It is budget time followed by election season, so everybody's moving and shaking right now. Last Thursday, I overheard a conversation Mr. Branch was having at a local Starbucks with two men at the table sitting next to me talking about investing taxpayer dollars in the Hampton Roads Alliance. He you know, made his point of, we have a $2.4 billion budget, so what's a half a million dollars to bring the cities together? Well, yet here we are wasting time to discuss implementing a vote requirement. If a council member wants to spend over $50 on a, a community event, this is how power works. Stop hiding under the guise of transparency when we know the concept of more government input goes against your political principles. 
I believe the root of this policy change is about control and an excellent example of politicians using power of the majority to stifle the voices of the minority. Why should council members like Ms. Wooten and Ms. Henley have to kiss the ring and negotiate for a vote to offer forums they have already been hosting with success? I understand the need for processes and guidelines to protect the city staff from potential overuse and adding to their already busy workload. You can promise that this unnecessary change to the policy will not impact those established events, but you still have the power over the vote. My concern isn't having a written policy in place to set expectations. It is the added stipulation of a vote. If a council member views the policy, then you hold them accountable publicly since you're all about transparency, right? I'm a woman who manages the day-to-day -day operation of my small business. I'm not just a name on paperwork allowing an entitled man to abuse privileges that minor minorities and women have worked so hard to get from legislators. I have never felt supported by the city as a small business owner. The message this body has sent for decades is that the only people that matter are land developers, hoteliers, and white men with pockets of cash they made on cocaine trafficking in the 80s. I paid an embarrassing amount of money for this hard to find book documenting the Virginia Beach elite, called Tough Enough. 10 out of 10 recommend for a real history lesson on Virginia Beach. Once you make this change, you can use your majority to stifle Ms. Wooten's progress for minority and women business owners getting engaged in opportunities <coughs> to do business with the city. I bet some of you will want to use those same resources for visibility in your districts before elections. My life experience has taught me to view situations and make decisions from a 30,000 foot view instead of ground level. At ground level, we tend to look only at ourselves and our individual needs. If you ascend to a higher elevation, you can see how the consequences of your actions can impact many people. Some of you are living in silos below ground. Appreciate it. Election season's upon us, friends. Next speaker is Carl Wright. After Mr. Wright is Mabenti Canoe. I know I messed your name up every time, sorry. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. City Manager, City Council members, everyone. Mr. Branch, heard your name mentioned here a minute ago. <clears throat> I'm in opposition of this situation because I, I see it as a as a matter of abuse. I think we've heard the word toxic really quite a few times throughout the year. And these are the situations that I think they consider toxic. Because what happens is we get into a position of someone does something that we don't agree of or we can't get them to get it out of the clicks. And we figure out a way to uh, change that. I would reach out to some folk that have that you, you know, to do more of uh, forms and events. We would like to see you, particularly when we live in your district. We would like to see you do more. We would like to see you come out, hear what your, your thoughts are on your folks in your district. I mean, when, when people do work, I, you guys ran to work. I like seeing these folks that come out work. You know, Ms. Wilson, I love to see folks work. You know, if you can set up here for 20 years or more, then let's, let's get some things done and then share it with the community. You know, a couple of dollars to put on a form or an event, an uh, informative event for the community, that's what I thought we were supposed to do. Now we're trying to tie folks' hands so they can't come out and inform the community. I want to be informed. I want to know what you're doing. You know, I understand you have your little meetings, you know, with your buddies and that type of thing, but at least give us the impression that you're trying to get the information to the community. So I definitely oppose this. I think it's, I don't know who came up with that idea, but I think you need to revisit it because it's wrong. You know, there's a next generation coming on of folks that will be sitting up here representing folks. And I don't want, I don't think you should send them that message that if you don't agree with folk giving information out, that you should find a way to tie their hands. This is going on and on and on. I know Barbara has had, I remember Ms. McClannan used to have uh, events like that. And I, and I appreciate that. You know, I may not be able to make them all, but at least uh, attempt to send out the message so we can get some of the information. But tying a person's hand behind a couple of dollars because you don't agree with uh, their approach or maybe you will look envious of their approach sometimes is it's not right. So uh, I'm definitely opposed it, and I hope that uh, it's voted down. Thank you.
Thank you. Just, <laughs> I'm sorry, I always mess your name up. Mabitney Canoe. Good evening. Good evening. Ed Walls. Um, greetings, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor and Council and everyone else. My name is Mabinti Kanoon, Councilwoman Sabrina Woodson's assistant. I am here today to talk about Councilwoman Woodson Ignite series. Requiring Ms. Woodson to have additional approval for each event has a potential to stall the event as a whole as it prolonged the planning and organizing process. The initial approval was granted in 2019 and served to have a lasting effect as each event is organized. To acquire additional approval calls into question the initial approval. Ms. Woolton has hosted a, num a number of events since the series was created and none of them had to be approved. I humbly ask to not require additional approval for this Ignite series. This event has helped the City of Virginia Beach small businesses owner and those looking to start a business. Each event provides valuable resource that will benefit every individual. Ignite is full of guest speakers who are successful business owners and are very knowledgeable in the business world that assist and give an extra hand to those who participate. Ms. Wilton works hard to provide such a credible, successful event for Ignite as each event is different. Recently, we had an Ignite pitch competition where 10 different participants pitched their business. Before that, we had Ignite business panel. Councilwoman Ms. Wilton's goal is to provide an extra hand to the resident of Virginia Beach to help and uplift entrepreneurs and small businesses. Again, to continue the successful of Ignite and help current and future business own future business order owner, please consider not to require additional approval to the Ignite series. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ed Walls, and then Andrew Jackson. Good evening. Good evening, Council. Thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is Ed Walls. I represent Team Lamb Inc. Uh, Team Lamb is an acronym for Tell Everyone Around Me, Love All My Brothers. Uh, we are a brand that started in 2011, um, and we are a product of the Ignite business series. Uh, we've been a part of it since the beginning, and I uh, wrote a few words. The Ignite Business Series is an inspiration and true leadership in our community, and the heart is set on serving the people. The disparity study should have the privilege to go on without any disturbance based on the results, reputation, and impact that we have felt from being directly involved. Recently, an article from I Am Viral Virginia a social media platform on Instagram, stated that Virginia Beach placed high on top cities where African-American <coughs> fare best economically and minority businesses thrive. According to personal finance website, Smart Access, Virginia Beach has the seventh highest median black household income at about $65,000 and it is the sixth highest black labor force participation rate at about 79%. People always talk about Charlotte, Atlanta, but Virginia Beach is right on their heels. We offer our support to Ignite Forum and Disparity Studies to continue to expand the knowledge of minority small businesses by creating generational wealth and to close the wealth gap, which is heavily lopsided. And if anything that we gain from Ms. Wooten's seminars is opportunity. So if you all stop this, then you stop opportunity for small business, uh, business entrepreneurs like myself. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Andrew Jackson. After Mr. Jackson is David Leader. Good evening. Good evening. City Council, Mr. Mayor, City Manager, all of you, Mr. Stiles, 
I'm going to include you too. I decided to say a few things, but I decided I would read it instead. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned, first off, with why this even became an issue. Who, who, who's behind the curtain pulling the strings? And for what reason? It took years for one thing to come along. We fought, 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 just for a disparity study. A study that then told us, yeah, there are some things that we've been telling you about for years that need to fix. And so it seems like all along the way, there's always someone behind the curtain pulling the strings. So there be a little hold up here and a little hold up there with no real rationale for that. I, I, I challenge somebody, come to me, tell me what the rationale is. And I'll show you someone that doesn't have one, but there is an issue behind it. What is known for uh, this issue is that there is a function that is going on now that is effective, that is necessary, that is needed, for this community to get us rolling because we are years behind because we didn't appreciate the talent we had here and left them sitting in the dark. We finally had a study that said, let's do something to lift these people out that have been disenfranchised, underserved for all of these years. And I can sit here and look at all of you. Most of I was I was here before you were born. So I can tell you what the city's like. And I can see when there's an agenda out there that wants to block something that's successful. I won't point any fingers, but I'm in the street every day. This issue is a hold up. It's a block. It's something that says, they're moving too fast. Let me slow them down. There's an old, I, I, I like to read some of the Indian proverbs, and there's one that says, I see you. I'm going to close with that. I see you. This is an effective program which anyone will tell you is good for them and good to them and helps them. I would even question how many of you have even been to one of those functions and ask anybody, has this helped you before you put this on the table? I would ask you to reconsider. And for the person that brought it up, Thank I would you. ask you why. Thank you. The next speaker. And the last speaker is David Leader. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Thank you for having us today. I would like to read a letter that was composed by a small business. My name is David Leader, by the way. I'm also a small business owner in the city of Virginia Beach. I'm a part of Team Lamb. LLC. This letter states, good afternoon, council members. I'm addressing the revision to the ordinance put forth by council member Michael Bellucci. <coughs> this revision will negatively impact the Ignite conferences and disparity programs that Councilwoman Sabrina Wooten put in place to help minority-owned businesses thrive. Actually, since the Ignite events are open to the public, any citizen within Virginia Beach can attend. It was particularly initiated and established as a support system for marginalized communities. I was present at the city council meeting when Councilwoman Wooten's efforts for Ignite were approved. I would like to ask, have any of you ever attended an Ignite conference at least twice other than Mayor Dyer? I have never seen many of you there, including former council members. I write this letter respectfully. However, I do not find the revision to be respectful. Why would Council Member Wooten or any other council member have to make a routine request to approve funds for an event that is seriously benefiting the community? If the issue is truly rising cost of staff, I am certain that throngs of volunteers would love to donate their time on site. The overarching question is, is Virginia Beach willing to invest in small minority owned businesses? Have the council members asked the participants about the value of the Ignite program? 
as Virginia Beach's small businesses grow in revenue, the more taxes for the city, the more potential for an increase in leasing spaces revenue and the more disposable income available to shop within the city. It's a win-win for the city. I ask that you first consider the testimonies from the Ignite participants. A good leader weighs a matter by looking at the data and hearing from those who are impacted before making a decision. It's not just dollars being spent, it's an investment in lives that matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bullerji. Mayor, I move for approval, and upon receipt of a second, I'd like the chance just to say a few words. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mayor, as, you, as was mentioned previously, this was a deferral from April 5th when we had a robust discussion and covered a lot of ground that evening. So I'll try to keep my remarks shorter than, um, than they were on April 5th. But uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, all of those who came to speak this evening. I really appreciate your investment of time and interest in this topic. Um, and I really regret that uh, this discussion became about the content or merit of specific programs, because that is not the intent of the policy. Um, and it's not what the focus of this discussion really is. Because actually, um, this council, since I've been on it, has uh, demonstrated a record of supporting those, those programs and for supporting the Ignite series, the Disparity Study Forum, and others. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that because I think the record is well established. But this policy actually is about the role of uh, council members in a council manager form of government. And that's an important distinction and it's one we actually have a responsibility and an obligation to preserve. Um, this policy also is about transparency and accountability when uh, when a uh, council member is using city resources. So in the course of our business, it's very often that uh, as candidates, uh, forums and discussions occur, and those are sponsored by campaigns or individually. But when we do something as a city, we have to bring a level of uh, accountability and transparency and understanding and actually consent, because no single member of this body has the authority to direct council members individually. And we need just to make sure that that distinction is made. And in a council uh, manager form of government, we should have had a policy like this a long time ago, actually. Um, and so that's what this is really about. Um, it addresses uh, the possible perception that taxpayer resources, our resources, uh, could be used for personal promotion. And I think uh, having a review of council and consent of council um, goes a long way to eliminate the perception that that could exist. So I just want to emphasize, again, this is not focused on specific events. It's not meant to hold up progress. In fact, um, as, a, as, since, as I mentioned, since I've been on this council, we have supported those programs, and we have been advocates for addressing the disparity study. I know I have, because my votes are, are well established and recorded, and so are the ones of my colleagues here in this body. So I'm sorry that it became about that, because actually it has nothing to do with that. And I really, I really want to try to drive that point home because I'm sure you're going to hear uh, otherwise later this evening, but that's just simply not the fact and the facts don't support that. This is about responsible use of taxpayer resources that include staff time, and it's also about preserving the integrity of the process when it involves taxpayer resources. That and only that is the focus of this policy. It doesn't have to do with preventing or permitting events, but it does draw a line about a single council member um, ordering the expenditure or employment of city assets without council consent or knowledge. We have to act as a body. That's what council members do as a legislative body. And finally, I just want to um, say that one of the, in, in the letter that was read, one of the statements was uh, focused around why would a council member have to make a routine request to approve funds for an event that is seriously benefiting the community? And the answer is simple, of course. We have to work together. Any taxpayer funds, these are public resources, are subject to consent and to, uh, and to approval by the body. That's, uh, council members have no individual role to do otherwise, and that's, that's what this policy in intends to do, and I think that's what it will achieve. And um, so I thank you for your time, I thank you for your attention, and I thank you for your engagement. 
and um, look forward to the continued discussion. Thank you. As a second. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Moss. As a second, I just wanted to mention it also codifies no activities sponsored by the city by a can by a sitting council member 90 days prior to the election to avoid any appearance that you're campaigning or and I don't even think council would even approve that kind of activity and that means since we now vote in the middle of June that starts in about no I mean middle of September we have early voting means from June on we really are trying to make sure that there's no appearance that we're using our positions to advance our own reelection or just like Congress does so I just wanted to point that as also as part of the ordinance Okay. Thank Anybody you. Anybody else? Ms. Henley. Uh, well, when this came before us uh, before, I had some questions about it because I was afraid that it maybe did um, hamper uh, the ability of council members to uh, provide information to, to people, and primarily because I do have a regular uh, forum every month uh, just to provide information to anyone who would like to come. Um, and one of the speakers indicated that only people from the Princess Anne District were allowed to come, and that's simply not true. I do provide information of projects primarily from the Princess Anne District because that's the purpose of it, but anybody is welcome, and, and people do attend who are not from the district. I do have it here uh, in Building 19. Uh, which is city property, and there is one city staff person who helps uh, uh, open the building and so forth, and occasionally I have a staff person come to explain something that's going on, and I just <coughs> wanted to make certain that everything that, that I do in that fashion is, is uh, acceptable, and, and uh, I think it has been worded to make certain that that kind of uh, forum is uh, allowed. Uh, on the few occasions that I have provided refreshments, usually just strawberries, it's been at my own expense. I don't use any city money uh, for something of that nature. I, I just wouldn't do that. So I just wanted to clarify that that kind of um, opportunity is still available. Um, Any time that I have proposed a project that involved uh, city money, I've always felt that I needed to get, come to council because you have to have council support for that. I really think this does make a written policy of the way that council has acted in the past. I don't see anything new here uh, that isn't the, the format that we have, have followed uh, in the past because uh, in order to spend city money, uh, it takes a, a vote of council. So I think this just simply uh, makes a written policy of the way the council has uh, worked and should work, and I certainly don't think that it's going to cause the uh, uh, a, a program that, you know, is good uh, and uh, has had council support from continuing to work. I sort of relate this to a, a, a project that I have promoted, and that is the work that we're doing in tree preservation and to get the uh, uh, study done by a Virginia Tech researcher. And in order to do that, I came to the city council and asked for that to be done, and as we have updated it, I have continued to update the council, and I think that's the way council members have been working for years and should continue to work. And, and so I think that it allows council members to bring forward projects and requires that, that, that it be something that the, the council uh, agrees to. And I have absolutely no objection to that. That's the way it should work. If there's money to be spent, it should be approved by the council. And so I think that this just makes a written policy of the way we've been operating. And so I do support it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Wooten. Absolutely. Thank you. So, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who came out to speak on behalf of the very important programs, the Ignite Business Series seminar, and the Disparity Forum. Please stand up if you're here to support those programs. Please, please.
Thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. It is no small feat to come all the way down here to City Hall where you don't live in the vicinity, but come all the way down here to express your opinion, uh, your affirmation uh, for, very, for very important programs um, because there are two, Ignite Business Series and a Disparity Forum. And so I've heard my colleague, Council Member Bellucci, say it's not about those programs. So my question for Mr. Bertolucci, how did this ordinance come about? Because I, I still have yet to speak to you about it, yet we pass, we see one another, you've said nothing to me, but I did overhear you say to Ms. Uh, Council Member Henley that it was not about her program or forum, but I didn't have the same conversation with you. So tell me, how did this ordinance come about where you're <laughs> striving for transparency? That's a question. In your discretion, continue. Mr. Bellucci. So you don't want to answer it. So let me deduce my observation. A couple of weeks ago, this resolution, ordinance, excuse me, came forward. Now, the, the ordinance subjects or subjected to council members who hold forums and events. Well, that's me. And then council member Henley also objected and had an issue with it. So, I will deduce, since she's good, and I heard the conversation from Council Member Bellucci, that it wasn't about her forums. I can tell you with sincerity, affirmation, it's about Ignite. Who made it about Ignite? I didn't make it about Ignite. I was never addressed, talked to, uh, informed, the policy just came up out of nowhere. And so since Council Member Berlucci doesn't want to state the facts and the truth, I will. You made it about these programs. You did. And let me dispel the lie here and inform you of the truth. These programs were approved way back, 2019. And I promise you, ever since they were approved, I have had nothing but opposition in the form of ordinances, policies, resolutions, trying to stymie the progress of those programs. That tells me, and it shall, should tell the community, we're on to something here. These, these programs are very powerful. They're very beneficial. How do I know this? Because I talk to people in the community who attend the programs. I've seen them start businesses. I've even talked to staff members who say, thank you, this is good for the community. The data's out there, I, I do surveys, and people uh, always come to me and say, Ms. Wooten, let's try this now. How about, let's, let's put this program on for the young adults. Hence, when we had the Ignite Pitch series and those groups came out. It come, these programs, the topics, they come from the community. People reach out to me and ask me <coughs> to do different topics. It's not about me, and nor should it be. I, I am certainly in agreement with uh, uh, transparency, which is why I do the disparity forum. That's all about transparency. 
We spent over $400,000 on a disparity study that came back with recommendations that said women, small businesses, minorities, and services uh, business veteran owners uh, were experiencing a disparity in contracting with the city. I mean, those are the facts. And I can tell you by looking at the data, and I reviewed the data, and unfortunately, we don't have this conversation on um, a frequent basis with the community. So they may not always be aware of the data uh, and the numbers, but I can tell you way back when this program started in 2019, we were working with total expenditures from 2017 to 2018 from minority business um, owners of 6.5%. That was 20. 17, 2018. For women businesses, owned businesses, it was 9.1%. And so fast forward to 2018, 2019. Minority business owners, the expenditures fell back to 4%. And then women owned businesses fell back to 5%. Way back. Fast forward to 2020, the data shows the minority business owners, the expenditures, is at 6.1. Again, that's regression. It's only one point, a one point increase from 2017, 2018. And then for women owned businesses, it's 7.3% in 2020. So again, remember we started with, in 2017, 9.1%. So we keep going forward. We went forward a little bit. We went back. Then we went back again. So the programs that were approved by this body, the majority of this body, felt the need to address the disparity through those programs. That's why they were initiated. And that's why I continue to do them, because they've been approved. And so. You know, as I look at the connotation of this ordinance, and I study it, and, and I, I can look and see uh, what the truth is, say whatever you want to say. I can see what the truth is. I know that by passing this ordinance, because I use media, promotions, and all of this standard things that go with promoting city events, those are going to call, or those programs or those added um, tools will cause me to come back and forth to council asking for permission to do an approval. Now, if that's what you want me to do, I have no problem with doing that because it's for the community. The community the one who voted me in. So if I have to fight a little harder, ask a little bit more, happy to do it. I'm here for all of that. That's my job, to support the community. Stand up as many, time, as many hoops as you want me to jump through. I could do that. I got time to do that. That's why I'm here. So as I look at you know, this ordinance, it's, it's, now this is my perspective. And some people will say, well, why she have to say that? And I don't agree. This is my perspective. When I look at this ordinance, to me, it's tantamount to legislation back in Jim Crow days. During legislation that civil rights leaders fight, and they still fight it today because it's implicit, it's implied. They didn't say you couldn't vote specifically most of the time. They just put hurdles in front of you. Count the jelly bean, count this. Do you know the Constitution? Can you re I know all of that. I remember that history. And when I look at this ordinance, 
that's what I see. That's the spirit of this ordinance. And I know what I'm talking about. I, I've seen this type of animal before. And so I have to address it. I have to stand up and say something because these programs are for the people. I'm an advocate to fight for the people. That's why they put me here to do programs just like that. And let me add, it's I've held programs for veterans. And I can't tell you the number of veterans who come out and say thank you. We had no idea this information existed. It's about education and awareness where the disparity study, one of the recommendations was there is a disparity because there's not adequate education and awareness. So these programs were specific to address that recommendation. And that's what they do. They bring education and awareness to people who might want to be a part of the contracting process. But if they don't know, how can they compete? If they're not on a certain list, you know, or a certain group that's in the know, how do they compete? And so my job through these programs is to do outreach, to reach out to those who may not know. And you heard the gentleman say he'd never even heard about SWAM. And, and that's the case for a lot of uh, individuals, business owners. Uh, and that's the forum, that's the spirit in which those programs have been set up for. And so, you know, I I'm, I'm look back at the mission statement of the city of Virginia Beach. The city of Virginia Beach exists to enhance the economic, educational, social, and physical quality of the community and provide sustainable municipal services which are valued by its citizens. These programs are valued by its citizens. They, they've told you that. These programs are education. It's embedded in the mission of, this, of the city of Virginia Beach. Not doing anything illegal. Not doing anything wrong. I'm enhancing the mission of this city. That's what we all should be doing. Now, in terms of going forward, as I mentioned, if this ordinance pass, passes tonight, you know, I, I'm going to continue to work with the community and to continue to do what I have to do to make sure these programs move forward. But let's just get something straight here. We're talking about $3,000. $3,000, which, if you divide it by the number of people in this city, over 450,000 or so, that's 67 cents per person. 67 cents. Now, I've looked at tons of programs that cost exponentially more thousands of dollars more. In fact, you heard someone talk about the electoral system and the appeal. He spent tens of thousands of dollars on that appeal that may or may not even really impact the system. But you spent it. You agreed to spend it. I didn't. I didn't think that was a, a good use of the taxpayer's dollars, so I, I disagree with it. But now we want to be transparent. Now we want to be cost effective. Now we want to make sure we, OK. <laughs> that's what you say, but that's what, not what your actions show. I mean, be real. Say what you're going to say. Stand for it. If you don't like the programs, you have a problem with it, I respect you if you just say that. Just say that. But don't try to cast or stymie the programs that are trying to go, go forward and act as if you don't know what I'm talking about. That's all.
Okay. Anyone else? Okay, at this point, the vote is open for passage. By a vote of nine to one, you've approved the ordinance. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, the next one is an ordinance to author number eight to authorize the city manager execute a lease for up to five years with the Depart development authority for property located at 26 uh, 56 with Shell Place. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. Thank you, Mr. Berlucci. I don't appreciate the fact that you were attacked for repeating what has been brought to the council's attention many times and other people agreed with, so I don't think you should be singled out, and I appreciate it. And I think it's, you know, Mr. Dyer talks about having decor. Okay. De okay. Oh, okay. okay. I, please. Okay. Please this. Stick to the topic. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, uh, I'm talking to Miss. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad this one didn't take as long. Okay, which item again? This is number eight. Eight. Okay, let me put the other glasses on. The only good thing about the, the long speech is I, I got to have a break. Got to go to the little girl's room real quick. Okay, eight. Approve a term sheet Ray, development, uh, Pembroke Mall. No, ma'am, that's nine. We're in number eight. Oh, we're at eight, okay, all right. Uh, it's both development, okay. Uh, term sheet or redevelopment of Pembroke Mall. No, ma'am, this is the regarding the Lachelle Place, number eight. You must have the wrong one. Oh, okay, the wrong one. Yeah, this. This is a problem with, uh, you know, having two agendas. We don't have two agendas. We have one agenda. It was email. There's two. I printed the first one. And, okay. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous that y'all advertise something. Mr. Moss, you should be paying attention to this. So should you, Mr. Bellucci. Um, so don't start my time then. No, okay. So eight. This is the one that uh, I think it was Mr. Harmeyer gave me. Um, okay, see, this is change. You shouldn't change uh, an advertised lease, the one that's in the, the beacon. Uh, execute a lease for up to five years with development authority. Um, you know, I oppose the leasing of land uh, because, you know, of reasons given before, but this brings up the development authority which met this morning. And the fact that all, this ties in with what you just spoke about. The development authority partners, partners, and so does the finance department with the Ignite series. You know, you need to look at uh, leaders who want people, you know, to not get a helping hand because uh, you know, it goes back to uh, I'm trying to think of her name. Thank I, you I, very I, much. Uh, no, uh, Martin Luther King, Leo Thank Terrell. Thank you very much. Red light. The next speaker uh, okay. is Sarah Gerloff. Okay, this is about the lease at 2656 Lachelle Place. Um, background states that this is a suitable location for an industrial incubator where new and growing or growing businesses or companies, excuse me, could temporarily locate until they become established and move to a permanent space. Um, is this a taxpayer, is this taxpayer funded? Like, are we giving money to companies to, while they're in this location? It's kind of confusing, that's what I wanted to know. Um, because that brings me to the, um, I mean, we're really not interested in incubating and hatching out businesses. Um, that brings me to um, subsidizing businesses. 
So subsidizing businesses has and always will be unlawful um, because it is unequal treatment of businesses. If you subsidize some businesses but not others, you're not treating them equally. So we know that we're supposed to be treating everyone equally under the law. And we really shouldn't be subsidizing any businesses. So when you take our tax money and you subsidize certain businesses, then what has actually occurred is that now I have ownership in that business. So now I am a stockholder. And any, any business that's been subsidized in the city, I'm a stockholder in now. I don't really want to own these businesses. I didn't agree to let you take my money and subsidize certain businesses and not others. So I'm obviously opposed to this. I don't, I, I now own part of this property because I am a taxpayer and I am opposed. I object to my portion of this property being leased. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, do we have a motion? Move for approval. Second. Any discussion? Vote is open. Thank you. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have approved the ordinance. Okay, moving on to item 9, resolution to approve a term sheet rate development of Pembroke Mall request approved by the Department uh, Development Authority and authorized mm -hmm. the development of a de uh, definitive project's documents. We have one speaker, Barbara Messner. Ms. Messner. Okay. Pembroke Mall. I was born and raised in Norfolk, but I've been in Virginia Beach 40-some years. And Pembroke Mall <coughs> should not be uh, turned into some monstrosity um, for special developers. Uh, this is a development authority. That's the debt arm of the city that's subsidizing private developers. People need to look at the, um, at the websites and the programs and the fact that, you know, Mr. Adams is a city manager, deputy city manager, and with the development authority. Um, yeah. You know, you're, you're putting mixed use. You're social engineering our city. You don't have a right to do that. You don't have a right to use their money to reinvent. Jim Spore, your, one of your predecessors, you know, he has a, a company after he retired in 2015, reinvent Hampton Roads, subsidized by the governors. <coughs> Debbie Wynn from the pilot, you know, had one that was subsidized by the governor. All this regional stuff, it's air money. And you should not be, um, we shouldn't have a development authority that we're paying for. And it, it goes to mostly wealthy people. It's not even a loan. Look how many times you've subsidized steel chainsaws and they advertise on TV. Aldi's, Lidl's, on and on and on. So I oppose. Thank you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion? Mr. Moss. Well, before I get to a motion, I'd like to have a little discussion, if I could, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Can we get the motion out first, John? Well, I would want to move that the city be the people that do okay. the Okay. Yeah, go ahead and it's bring the, that that's what I It's the alternative okay. resolution because I... I think often when we, and we talked about that a little bit today, when the city is doing something, because the debt, whether it's issued by the development <coughs> authority or by us, is counted against our debt policy. So there's no debt policy advantage of using the development authority. In fact, the city gets a better rate, maybe 25 to 50 basis points when we issue the debt versus the development authority. So it's a little bit more expensive. But, but we also then own it. 
you know, if we're the ones that own it, so when the debt is paid, the title of the parking garage belongs to us, which is the people of Virginia Beach, versus the development authority, which is a separate, distinct legal entity of the state. So since we can do this debt, I support the project. Let me just say that right up front. I said that before. Uh, uh, I think that it has some issues. Uh, but relatively speaking, if we're going to have high density, then this is the place to have it versus on Shore Drive versus some other places where we have imposed it. Uh, this is the place where it makes sense. It's where the transit is. And let's be honest. B2 in that location, I remember when that mall opened in Constitution on that side was the Oyster Shell Road. Lewis may remember that as well. It wasn't even paved. So and there was an Indian village where the uh, a thing you would tourist and visit, that's where the bookstore is. So it's, I'm older than I look, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, but my point being is this is the place to stimulate, but at the same token, when they try to go to their next phases, I think we've done the seed for the parking garages, and in the future, if they want to build office buildings, the parking garages are their own. That's my own view. But I think this is a positive event. Now, the biggest disadvantage, and I'm always one to talk about both sides, because I think you deserve balanced information, is we have to make a sole source determination to proceed, whereas the development authority is exempt from the Competition Procurement Act. Not necessarily the best thing in the world, but it is. But that is the one singular advantage. I think in light of the nature of this agreement, I think when I went and looked at all the sole source determination, I think it would qualify because what we're trying to achieve. But my belief is that we should own these garages because it's the people's tax, real estate tax dollars. Why are we going to get the tax dollars in, then rebate them to the development authority so they can then pay a loan? It's us. It's the people. And I think it's a cleaner transaction. So I would propose the adoption of having the city actually be the, the partner. <coughs> the same, it's the, you can see that in front of you. It's the same agreement. It just says, where it said development authority, it says the city of Virginia Beach. And that would be my proposal. Yeah, do I have a second on this? Well, let's, have, let's, discuss, let's get a little discussion here first. Mr. Uh, uh, Stiles, is there any legal issues here that, that uh, you can identify? Or that no, the city can legally do it. Big part we can no, legally do it. can legally do it. Okay. Rosemary. Is uh, Deputy City Manager Mr. Adams here? Mm -hmm. Would you mind coming forward? So We're can you call you uh, Mr. Hotspot? <laughs> Good evening, Vice so Mayor. Can you Thank give you. us the pros and the cons of the development authority versus the so you so we know what we're doing here? I will I will do the best I can recognizing uh, Kind of like Mr. Stiles said a moment ago where he hates to give legal advice on the fly. Um, I'll, I'll be just shooting from the hip on this. So um, as I understand the question, the question is uh, to give the, the differences operationally in the city owning these garages versus the development authority owning these garages, correct? Well, operationally, debt financing, the whole everything that... So, so for the debt aspects, I would have to lean on uh, both the finance director and, uh, and Mr. Harmeyer from the, uh, from the city attorney's office. And, and, and I would ask that, uh, that, that we be allowed to put something in the Friday packet specifically on the debt. Um, operationally, the, the, only, the only difference that, that I see here is there are um, your your precedent has been that the development authority has, has owned these in the in the past, and generally that has been, I think, to accomplish a um, uh, I said more flexibility in the operation. For example, the uh, the the, dedic the designation of spaces for temporary uses, um, the uh, the rental of space <coughs> for, for monthly occupants, things of that nature. Um, as as I have thought about this, it. Um, Initially, my, my thought was that it might be challenging to do that um, if the city owned it, but, but I think that, that operationally you could, you could certainly, if the city were the owner operationally, that's, that is probably something that we could figure out uh, to, to Mr. Stiles' point that uh, there's no legal prohibition. We would just have to, we would have to figure out how to do it. Can I ask you a question on this? So, so yes, the development authority has all of the town center garages. Yes, ma'am. For economies of scale, would it be better, 
since they're doing all of those to do this one too, or does it not matter? Um, fortunately, I have some staff in the room who, <laughs> who work more directly with parking day in and day out than I, than I do. <coughs> and as you know, Vice Mayor, I, I try never to speculate with this body. I, I try to sort of be as accurate as we can. So, um, so we're good. Vice Mayor, my team tells me that, that we are good. Uh, so it tells me that, we, that, that, that operationally this, this can work. The, the one thing that I would want to do um, uh, in the interest of, of fairness to, and, and, and I don't see any reason why we could not do it, uh, uh, provided you all were comfortable and we, we came to you for, uh, uh, with any issues that we saw al along the way. The key for me is I don't want to impose a standard on the Pembroke development that is more rigorous and onerous than the standard that, are, that is across the street at uh, um, at town center, and, and I did not hear the council member suggesting that's what he wants either. Huh. So it would. So what what I would say is, if I can, let me work with with Mark's team and with my team in parking to dive into that issue. If we see an issue, we'll bring it back to you. But I'm hearing from my team that we don't see anything. Well, <clears throat> Would it be a problem if we defer this so we can make sure? That's what I'm that's what I was just yeah. going to suggest. I, I don't yeah. think it's because time I, I don't really feel comfortable because I don't think we have all the information that we need. But is it going to upset the project? So I, so I know that the uh, that the team um, from uh, uh, from Pembroke Partners is in the room and uh, and is quite motivated to move forward. Um, uh, Certainly, if we certainly if this council wants to defer, we we, we would not want to get in your way. At, but uh, but I I am comfortable with the assurance that my team has, has had, and we and, and we saw an advance on this. Taylor, uh, Mayor and Councilmember Moss, if we find something, right, would you have any opposition of us bringing something back forward? Because I think basically what that's right we're saying, if there's any administrative hurdles that now the city has to do because we own it if maybe we could bring back some language forward to amend it yeah well, I kind of deferring is a great idea yeah. but i would like just to mention when it came as the development authority we never even discussed the options of how it could be done it just came in the package uh, as an answer so that's yeah. why i had yes sir you couldn't talk to alex till monday so i just but i do think it should be deferred so we can get more information on Mayor, alex is there behind you Approval we're seeking tonight, either way, is just to develop the definitive documents. So one path forward could be to vote on the on the term sheet, and as we're getting the binding stuff done, if we find any issues, we bring them back to you and say we need to change course because of. Because it's agnostic as to who the term sheet she is with. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. well, that's is, is that acceptable? Oh yeah, John? I'm not. It's not. I don't have any conditions on the deal. I like the deal. It's just. Who owns the debt and who owns the garage? Well, that's John. That, can was, you, that was my concern. Is on the debt. Uh, uh, is there any negative <laughs> impact on us as far as the debt, the interest rate, or anything like that? In both cases, the means of finance is public facility revenue bonds, and so it's tax-supported debt for purposes of the rating agencies, but it is subject to appropriation for purposes of the legal constraints. So it's, it's the same debt, whether it's the city that owns the physical asset or if the VBDA owns the asset. Okay. John, are you, uh, would you willing to modify yeah, your... Yeah, I move that we adopt in an agnostic fashion the term sheet. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? It's open. That, you know, that was a good, healthy yeah. discussion. It was. I appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Jones. So we're only voting, we're only adopting the term sheet? Just you just go over to one this time. Okay. Is that what you said you needed? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I think. Uh, I think with, with what Alex just said, the uh, with what you're approving tonight, we, we can work with that. And uh, and um, and and thank you for the questions. And as always, thank you to the city's attorney. Thank you to the city attorney and his team for keeping me in line. So I think what you would be approving is what Mr. Moss passed out, and what we're that saying the is that's, what that's I'm the motion, sure. right? Yeah. It's Mr. Yeah. Moss's alternative version. Yes. Well, but agnostic as to whom. Correct? Mm. I thought that's what we said. We weren't having a preference as to Well, it, 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 if we approve the version that you put forth, we will go forth with an attempt to draft it with city ownership, but come back and tell you if okay, there's a problem before we fair? do the definitive yeah, documents. I'm good. If everyone else is good, I'm good. Okay, great. No, Thank you. The alternative version. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Tower, may I have your vote? Okay, we close it. 
By a vote of nine to one, you have adopted the alternative version requested by Mr. Moss. Okay, thank you. I think we're up to item 15, and that is an ordinance to approve $550,000 from parking enterprise fund balance from fiscal 2021-22 economic development operating budget, Ray, pilot project for microtransit services in the resort area. We have two speakers. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. Okay. Ordinance to appropriate a little over half a million, 550,000 from parking enterprise fund balance. This isn't monopoly money, this is air money. <coughs> to 2021-2022 economic development uh, operating budget pilot program micro transit these silly little things you spent so much money on the resort and the people that really need bus service you know those those buses are run down um, plus I would love to know from the city manager uh, how much money uh, you know is made with all the advertising on these buses for attorneys and we even advertise for the city of Norfolk, but parking is a problem. And you don't just, the number one problem on the surveys that y'all admit is the tourists, not just the locals, but the tourists want to drive their cars. They want to park. You fixed it so only the people who live here or you know, can buy parking passes, which I, I think are $70, $70 uh, a month, uh, you shouldn't be selling air, air parking garages. Um, there isn't sufficient parking. And, you know, as I've stated before, the city attorneys give their opinions to council. They're your private attorneys, and it's not a legal ruling. The legal ruling has to come from Jason Myers or Colin Stolle, who, you know, has stated his conflicts. Okay, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. The next speaker is um, Ronna Marsh. Good evening. Mayor and council members, I'm here to speak to you about resort favoritism. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. We are going to take from all the parking around the city, the entire enterprise fund, and we're going to move more than a half a million dollars, 550000 to the resort. It seems like a lot of money when, you know, we're already going to move $45 million in a CIP that we're going to have bond debt for, for site acquisition, and none of us even know what that site or sites are. So when you start to add these up as an auditor like me, it looks like a finding, and I would call it resort favoritism. When you add it on top of the fact that in the budget we've got $90 million for ecotourism, we're very heavily weighted into tourism and to the development of the resort. This is at a time when families are struggling. Mr. Branch, you've been to see us out in, in Thalia. You know that we have a lot of people that are retirees. You know that we are not on big incomes. We don't own hotels. We're not trying to staff them with people from other places. We're trying to find money to just pay our bills. And over the 30 years, it's been over a billion dollars. I've shown this to you before. What's really dis distressing is other people in the state are noticing that we need to help citizens would be our <coughs> governor who is saying that he is going to try to lower the cost of living for citizens. So maybe rather than spending this money, it's time to step back and really think that citizens don't want this. I collected signatures Saturday, 10 days ago, and not one single person said we needed to spend 
$45 million at the resort, especially for what we didn't know. And when you look at how much we're spending on the TIP fund, we've gone from 30 years ago, the average per capita in tourism subsidies in 1994 was just $16.77, Ms. Wooten. So you're giving us a huge bargain with Ignite and your diversity, and thank you for doing that. Now, this year, Mr. Branch, we're going to spend $158 per capita on tourism at the TIP fund. The TIP fund needs to be reallocated. We need to make an SSD at the resort, and we need to start giving tax freedom to citizens because we don't want $45 million spent at the resort. We don't even know what you're going to spend it on. It's really a concern. There's no transparency, zero transparency. Thank you. That's all the speaker, sir. Okay, do we have a motion at this point? Move the adoption. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? I have a question for the city manager. I asked this question when this first came up and being briefed. My experience is you never enter into a pilot unless you know if it's successful, where you're transitioning it to, and who's going to pay the bill if and when you transition it. And so since we have a, so where is the funding? Uh, and so, certainly you go into a project thinking it has a high probability of success, or you shouldn't go into it to start with. Oh, it could fail, and that's okay too. You learn a lot from failure. But, but, but if it is successful, who's picking up the tab? Where, who's the, the, where's the resource allocation uh, coming from that's within the current growth pattern of cash flow. Is that the TIP fund that's going to eat that? Because I know we're supposed to get an updated sheet on their debt servicing costs to reflect all these projects. And we haven't seen that yet, I don't believe. But where, who's paying this bill if it's successful? Yeah. It is anticipated that is if this first year of the pilot program that's funded through the Parking Enterprise Fund, if it is a successful program and city council decides that like they'd like to transition over to this transportation program throughout the resort that the tip fund would be the bill payer well i think that's an important uh answer and to be sure so people know where that's coming from and i assume we would continue the same type of third party provider we're not looking to get into the capitalization so it would be a service yes sir that's correct All right. I just want people to out there that I understand people thinking that we're cruising in on Uber and some other people, but I think you innovation requires some risk taking, and I think this is probably a, a minor a minor cost. But if the tip fund's going to be paying the recurring bill, I'm okay. Okay, yeah, good points, John. Okay, guy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just would add um, that this is a, a program that hopefully will. Uh, alleviate some of our parking issues. It's one of the reasons, I think, for the enthusiasm <coughs> of the program. What happens in Virginia Beach is tourists come and uh, <coughs> they move their cars around. They, they like to go different places, which is good, but they take their cars and they, and they park. It didn't, they don't leave their cars parked in some hotel garage. They take them and they take up spaces in the street. They, they take up spaces in other uh, parking lots that overflow uh, and this is an attempt to see what happens if we can get the and it is designed of course to appeal to tourists uh, because it gets them around and gets them using our local businesses but not but not take up parking spaces at the same time I might point out however that it also is open to any any uh, resident or, or, or visitor so Virginia Beach residents, I expect, will be major users of this program. It, 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 it is an enticement to tourists, but it also uh, is an enticement to residents. And they, it creates the same issues with residents of moving their cars around as people like to go from restaurant to, to place. So I, I, hope this, uh, I hope this works <coughs> out. I think, it's, I think it will decrease the traffic, increase the available parking, and uh, be uh, and be a real pl a plus for the resort area and for the city. I might say, since the comment about spending money at the resort, 
uh, once again, money gets spent at the resort. Money comes out of the resort. A lot more money comes out of the resort is pretty much the standard. The studies prove that on a consistent basis and goes in. It is an investment. I'm not saying that there aren't other investments that are attractive as well, but the resort area is an investment. It's the reason we have it. It's, uh, we, don't, we don't pay for the ocean, and we do pay to keep it clean. We do pay to keep our beaches safe and clean, but that's, uh, that's what brings people here. But we have a lot of competition and being able to move freely around a crowded resort area is one of the ways we win some, that, more of that competition because it creates a better experience for, uh, for our visitors as well as for our own residents. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Mayor, I'll just... Uh, yes, Limewood. Because the TIF fund has been re uh, referenced, and uh, over the years I've asked for a listing of all the TIF fund... Uh, uh, things that the TIF fund is paid for and, and haven't received that yet, but from memory, uh, the aquarium, the convention center, the sports center, the new boardwalk, the Sandler Center, Princess Anne Fields, parking, and uh, those are capital projects. A lot of uh, beach events are funded out of, of the TIF fund. So I think the TIF fund, once we get the uh, list of all the things that it's accomplished, a case can be made that this city wouldn't be the same without the projects that that fund has financed. The money that's in there now uh, is the result of years of meetings with stakeholders, Civic League people, and the number one thing we've heard is parking. Parking is the issue. The resort area is the only place where restaurants and retail stores don't have to have any parking. And as a result, for decades we've used the neighborhoods as our satellite parking lots, and that has to come to an end. So money for site acquisition and uh, parking are in the uh, budget, in the TIP fund, because we're going to lose those opportunities as the beach uh, infills and, and develops, and the feeling of the community there was we have to make a move now to deal with the parking and to acquire property and, and construct parking garages so we can get the parking out of the neighborhoods and, uh, and that should have been done a long time ago. So that's why that money is in there, and I look forward, uh, Mr. Duhaney, to the list of the TIP-funded projects mm -hmm. because I want the public to see all the things that that fund has done over the last 30 years. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. I, John. Close it. I do think that was a, a legitimate uh, insight or constructive criticism. I do believe we need to add granularity to that 45 million, everybody on the street, the insiders know what our intentions are, and I think we would be much better off specifying what that's for, even if we end up and broke it up into projects so that people could see it. But I do think granularity would would go over in a much better fashion, and we should accomplish that before the budget public hearing on April 26. I think there's nothing to be gained by vagueness. I don't think it builds trust, and I think we should respond to that uh, constructive criticism. Thank you. Anyone else? Now, let me just say this very quickly. Uh, the future is now, and, I, you know, I think we're going to have, uh, between autonomous vehicles, uh, research that are horizon, and drones that are going to be part of a transportation solution, George Jetson will be visiting Virginia Beach pretty soon. <laughs> Okay, vote is open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have approved the ordinance. Okay, great. And now the final item, I open a planning hearing uh, on North Independent Storage LLC, Wells Fargo, for a conditional use for a mini warehouse at 1612 Independence Boulevard, District 9. R.J. Natter is representing the applicant. Thank you very much. It's I've only been here three three and a half hours, and I'm tired. Did you run the clock uh, off? I know, but uh, that's okay. Everybody wants lawyer relief, just like they want relief from taxes, like everything else. So uh, I'm afraid. So, but having said that, um, thank you very much for the record. My name is R.J. Nutter. I'm an attorney representing the applicant, and uh, I'm going to try to really make this brief because you're tired, and and I understand that. We submitted this application as a self-storage facility that complied with all your ordinances in terms of heights, setbacks, 
size, structures, everything. Staff recommended approval and your planning commission recommended approval. One of the benefits, and I really like this, Mr. Moss, one of the benefits of this application was that there were townhomes directly behind this property. And this property was one of three that were adjacent to those townhomes. And they, and some of them slanted, the property slanted down and were flooding those townhomes. None of which my client knew because they didn't own the property until we reached out. When we learned that, we were putting in the first, the city's newly created stormwater system that would take 100% of that water from both the building and the land and capture it and run it to underground stormwater tanks away from those properties. And that was the first of these three properties, and the only one of these three properties, where this application provided that relief. But uh, having, and that was when we went to the Planning Commission, one of the biggest concerns of the residents was how do you stop the flooding of their homes? And so, and because the Planning Commission knew very well as they, we have the strictest ordinance in the state on stormwater, uh, and, and additional changes to come, uh, then they, they knew very well that this was going to be part of the solution to the problem, not part of the addition to the problem. So that's why the recommendation was as strong as it was. However, we heard also that the residents of those townhomes behind us were very concerned about the height of the structure. Even though it complied with the ordinance, they were concerned about the height and the setback. So my client, and the reason why we deferred this you know, about two weeks ago, was we wanted to go back and sit down, hear from them, meet with Mr. Jones, make sure what we were doing was what he was hearing from his, his constituents. So we, in that case, we cut back about a third of the third floor so that the area of the building facing the residence is now, now 22 feet tall, not 34 feet tall. In addition to that, we, Mr. said, we, I want a bigger setback. So we increased the setback from 15 feet, which was required, to 25 feet. And the way this building is designed, only the closest portions of the building touch that 25-foot setback. So the net effect was because the build, building design, there's over 10,000 square feet of buffer now behind this building and those residents, the townhomes. And so, and so finally, then we talked to them about fencing because they were concerned we were going to put a fence across and block their, their fences. And we reached out to Ms. Connie Jones, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, forgive me. Oh, I'm sorry. I, so many, you've had so many titles, Mr. Jones, I apologize. So it, we reached uh, out to... Mayor, Vice Mayor, <laughs> Emeritus. <laughs> yes, sir. And, uh, and then some. And so, but at any rate, um, when we heard the concern was not that. We were only going to put fences at the two ends to prevent people from going back in that area and, and homeless people and others from anyways causing mischief to any of those homes, homeless in the back. So we agreed to all those things. So what, what we did is amend the application, have time to submit it to your staff. And so that resulted in uh, uh, my client speaking by phone to Ms. Woodard, who owns a shopping center. She said this made her feel much better about it. We then uh, mm. had uh, conversations with Mrs. Joan, Connie Jones, and I believe she's indicated to you, Mr. Jones, that she has withdrawn opposition, did not come tonight. And we all reached out to Ms. Ortiz, and Ms. Ortiz sent us an email this morning who's one of the adjacent owners as well, indicating that she was in favor. And beyond all that, we also have letters of support from two other neighborhoods in which this, my client's properties adjoin. And both those neighborhoods, and I'm happy to pass those out to you, both those neighborhoods wrote in favor of what a good neighborhood has been to have them as a neighbor. Because they are amongst the quietest uses, the building is largely unoccupied, they have one of the least traffic demands, which was great for the city on Independence Boulevard. We reduced the number of access points to the property from two to one. And so in every direction, this is an improvement from stormwater, traffic generation, curb cuts, buffer to the adjacent property owners, and not to mention stormwater and adjustments to the height. So I'd ask for your support in the application. Uh, we have one gentleman here who's is going to be speaking support as well on his property across the street. And, um, and I believe we may have one person opposition, I'm not sure. So I'll, I'll try to defer to any questions, Mr. Mayor or uh, any questions? Mr. Moss. I would like yes, to see the two neighborhood letters. I'm happy to. No, if you don't mind, I'll. This is uh, Ms. Ortiz's letters and the two neighborhood letters. Would you mind, Mr. Moss? I can give them back to you, Thank too. You. I don't need to keep this. 
Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, RJ, thank you. My pleasure. May the next speaker is Greg Rogers, and then after that it'll be Barbara Mesner. Uh, good evening. Hey, Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Greg Rogers. I've got a commercial building across the street from this proposal. And I bought that building back in 1999. And I've seen a lot of changes in the city. A lot of changes. Good changes. Some good, some not so good, but most are good. And um, I worked hard for this building. And I still own it, manage it, run it. And when I heard there was going to be a development across the way, I was curious. Always curious. How is this going to affect what I'm doing. But looking into it, um, I'm for it. I see these people uh, with, with a good plan. I don't see it being something uh, that's detrimental to the neighborhood. I'd rather see something like that go in there than something that's you know, not, not complimentary to the property. So I'm for it. I just want to let you all know that. So that's it. And also, you all go through a lot, I know, but I love the city. And I appreciate all you guys do. It's, you it's a great place Thank to live. You. Thank you go through a lot, but everybody here is doing their part to make this a better place. And if you look at the overall picture, we're pretty blessed to be here. So I just thank want to thank all of you. Next speaker is Barbara Messner, and the last speaker will be Melanie Twill. Mr. Dyer took a break. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it was only deferred prior when there were that, that many people opposing. It was usually 30 days or 60 days. But this isn't that much time, and it's right after Easter break. So, you know, it's really hard to get in touch with people. But... We have uncontrolled growth. We're in the first phase planning, planning, beware, of flood mitigation. You can't fix what you've already broken. You're just moving the water. So we have problems with flooding, uncontrolled growth, traffic, crashes, and... Um, You know, I'm in opposition. Um, you, there's no end. When are you going to end? Is it going to look like New York City? Are we going to have the same crime as New York? We already do per per 100,000 practically. Uh, the way you calculate the, uh, the crime is, you know, makes it look like it's not as bad. But the FBI's uh, stats are different. So I'm in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. The last speaker is Melanie Tool. Good evening. Thanks for hanging in there. It's been a long night. <laughs> We've been here since 1 o'clock. Oh, so it's been a long day. Well, I've been working too. So it's been a very long day for me as well. Um, thanks for having me. I was opposed to this until I was basically here just to make sure that they changed what they said they were going to change. The storm water, the height, distance from our home. I actually live there. My name's Melanie Tool. I live at 4707. I've been there for 26 years. I could have moved a thousand times. I like Virginia Beach. I was born in Norfolk and raised, and I own a little, you know, piece of heaven. So I'm not moving. I'm not going to be house broke. But I didn't want to see a three-story wall out my bedroom window. That was just too much. So, um, but I talked to an architect, and he said that it's really not going to mess with um, too much of our sunlight. So I'm, I'm, I'm really not opposed anymore. So thank you for your time. <laughs> and thank you for living in heaven. Morning. Yeah, I really love it. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Mr. Natter, would you like to come back up? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, do we have a motion? Yes. <laughs> He's got a question. Okay, question. Mr. Nutter, if you would, please. I just want the record to read, not that I'm 
Sorry. That's prejudicial to your project, but none of these letters are from the neighborhoods adjacent to the property. Oh, no, no. These are from two other neighborhoods. Oh, I know, but I just want to make sure that... Oh, no, no. I apologize. That they're from... He said, I'm afraid the letters, not the emails. I'm afraid the letters, they're from other parts of the city where there are storage devices. Yeah, by I just the, want by that to be clear. You're, you're exactly right. It <laughs> wasn't Pembroke Meadow or Pembroke Meadows or the apartments down that road. It just shows that there have been good neighbors in other areas. True. I just want to make sure that... No, you're absolutely right. Okay, thank Good. you very much. Hey, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, when, <clears throat> when we first got this application, quite frankly, I had a lot of questions about it. I was concerned about the height of the building. I was concerned about the closeness to the townhouses in the back, and I was concerned about the, the drainage. I think the drainage was probably already taken care of, yes, to be honest with you in the original application but the other two issues in particular uh, were concerning to me however having met with uh, mr. Nutter and uh, with the applicant yes, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, expressing those concerns and and uh, the fact that I was not happy about the height of the building and the closeness to the townhouses they've made the accommodations that I think uh, make this application acceptable and, uh, by uh, what they've done, lowering the back of the building and moving the building away from, further away from the townhouses, for putting in the swale that will take the water out to the front and so forth. I believe they've uh, made a concerted effort to make this, pro this project work, so I'm going to move approval. Second. Okay, any other discussion, John? Yes, I wasn't inclined to, to support this project only because of the big acreage, as big as Atlantic Park, across from the Pembroke Meadows Shopping Center that Mike Seifen owns. And when that uh, property develops, and it will, it might have generated a more income generating up use on that property over what's there now, just because of what that traffic that would generate. That's a big piece of vacant property that sits there. It's, I'm surprised, but Mike has time to wait to, to get the right thing, to get the right return. But uh, I think Mr. Jones, and I'll give you credit, Mr. Nutter, on your uh, stormwater thing. That is the thing I, I top of my list always. So with some regret about that it's not what I would like to see, I'm going to support Mr. Jones. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? The vote's open. I vote of 10 to 0. You've approved Thank the application. Okay. Good night, Eve. Thank you. Okay. Madam Vice Mayor, a few appointments. Yes. Um, the Green Ribbon com uh, Committee, uh, we have Rocky Holcomb. All right. You remember you signed up for that? That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, for the Audit Committee, uh, Stephen Sandoval. The Minority Business Council, um, Jaquita Clark Thompson and Francis Knight Thompson. On the Open Space Advisory Committee, we have uh, James Mari Hill and Joseph Walton. Uh, Parks and Rec, representing Bayside, Robert Hardigen. Thank you. Did I Pre pronounce it right? Yes, you did. Thank you very much. Uh, Planning Commission, um, uh, Michael Clemens, has to represent Centerville, is that correct? Uh, that's it for now. Vice Mayor, yes. uh, also the Community Criminal Justice Board, it's on the second page. Oh. Thank you. Uh, the, the Community Criminal Justice Board, um, Cal Bain, Tanya Bullock, Afshan Barashahi, Philip Hollowell, Paul Newdigate, Stacey O'Toole, Michael C. Paulson, Colin Stolley, Kenneth Stolley, Kay Thomas, and Guy Tower. Thank you. 
Okay. okay. Boat's right. open. One second. It's not. Sorry. It's open. Five out of ten to zero. You've uh, pointed those as read by Vice Mayor Wilson. Okay. Thank you. One. Thank you all. We are adjourned. Okay. Nine thirty-three.